Um, it is May 16th, 2022. Are we recording? Thank you. Um, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 22, this meeting is being conducted via remote means. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the regular town council meeting to order at 6.33. Um, I will call upon each councilor by name at that time. You should unmute and your mic and say present so that we know you can hear us and we can hear you. Shalini Balmilne. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Johanneke. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. M Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. Here. Pam Rooney. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. Alicia Walker. Present. Okay, there is no chat room. Uh, and if you have technical difficulties, given that we are about or we are experiencing a thunderstorm, um, please let us know. You may need to text uh, Athena or me. Um, and we will decide what to do with it at that time. Um, at this time, uh, before we go on to announcements, I'd like to recognize Anika Lopes and Pat DeAngelis. Thank you. I do not have thoughtfully executed words to share with you about the massacre that took place in Buffalo, New York on Saturday. Um, but I did pen a few words to keep myself focused as I'm still processing. Um, I speak representing myself and my ancestors who make up the first black and Afro-Indigenous families of Amherst. Today, when the Interior Department released the Indian Boarding School report further documenting the genocide unleashed on Native American peoples, I can share that on Saturday, I watched Amherst resident Dr. Shirley Jackson Whitaker speak at a rally in Northampton about uh, in support of reproductive rights. She talked about her ancestors, slaves, who had no choice of what happened to their bodies, chained, expendable, and how she stood on that very same space, that same place on Saturday. About that same time, the self-identified white supremacist set out on a mission to find black bodies and kill us with the word nigger written on his legal choice of murder. So I ask all of the non-Black and non-Indigenous residents of Amherst, as Shirley did at that rally in Northampton, what are you going to do? This is not to diminish anyone's suffering. It is to say that Indigenous and Black bodies have been legally brutalized since the inception of this nation. Law and signs will not protect us. We need you to organize and get involved with action that will. Thank you. Thank you, Anika. On Saturday, as Anika said, an 18 year old admitted white supremacist opened fire on a supermarket in a black neighborhood in Buffalo, New York, shooting 13 people, 10 of whom are dead. Those who died are Aaron Salter Jr., 55, Ruth Whittefield, 86, Catherine Cat Massey, 72, Hayward Tenney Patterson, 67, Pearly Young, 77, Roberta Drury, 32, Celestine Cheney, 65, Marcus D. Morrison, 52. Andre McNeil, 53. Geraldine Talley, 62. In a book called Citizen, an American Lyric, Claudia Rankin wrote these words at the end of a list of people, black people who had been killed by the police and other violence. She wrote, because white men can't police their imagination 
Black people are dying. I'd like us to take a, a minute of silence and just think about what Anika shared and about the 10 people who were slaughtered on Saturday. Thank you. Thank you, Anika and Pat. Um, we're going to quickly look at the announcements. They're in on the agenda. Uh, I would like to draw attention to some upcoming items. One is a American Indian powwow, which will be over Memorial Day weekend at the high school. Our Memorial Day parade will be on Monday of uh, Memorial Day weekend, and we will kick off Pride Month at the beginning of June. With that, we have to go on to our hearing. Uh, this is an Eversource petition to install a joint owned pole on the north side of West Pomeroy Lane across from 72 West Pomeroy Lane between two existing poles. The presentation for this is Michael. Is that yep, right? I'm here. Yes. Please go ahead. Um, Eversource is looking to uh, set a new pole um, on West Pomeroy Lane. Uh, oh, there you go. It's uh, needed to connect the existing circuit to. Uh, uh, a new solar field. Okay. Are there any other comments from other people from Eversource or representing Eversource? I don't think anybody else from Eversource is here. Okay. Are there counselor questions? Okay. Then I'm going to move to the audience and ask if there's any questions or comments. These are in relationship to the poll hearing only. There will be other public comment later. Okay, I'm seeing none, so I'm gonna go back. Are there any other questions from counselors? Shalini. I think it's the usual questions we have. How, if the um, if the people who are there and what is the impact on them, have they been informed? In, um, yeah, that's that's the big question. Yeah. Okay. We're also joined tonight by Guilford Mooring, uh, the superintendent of Department of Public Works. Mm -hmm. Um. Guilford or Michael? Yeah, uh, if you could put back that uh, that sketch again. Uh, all the uh, property owners in the vicinity are listed as abutters, and they got an invitation to this hearing, so they are informed. Okay. Thank you, Andy Steinberg. Andy, you need to unmute. I had to click twice, I guess. Um, I one one question may go to Guilford, um, and that is, uh, he had said in his memorandum to the council that there may be, pri I think it was the words, private trees removed, and um, and I wasn't sure where they were because it looked like the pole was going on town property and not on private property. So that was um, 
one subject and uh, the other subject um, maybe for when we get to a motion question, but the motion provided by Eversource didn't match um, one of the, the uh, a couple of points that I um, wanted to note. One was it used the word select board instead of the word council. And secondly, there was a point made in the presentation by Eversource in writing that uh, the town would be provided assured access on the poll for um, its own emergency services use, but that that was not included in the um, motion that was suggested by Eversource. So I guess those were my points so I was just wanted to raise. Um, Athena, you um, developed the motions for this and that motion appears under action item 8A. Uh, is that consistent with what we are seeing? And in my mind it is, but Andy, you might also wanna check that. It says to approve the order for poll location on West Primary Lane titled order for joint or identical poll locations dated January 20th, 2022 as amended according to the revised Eversource Petition Map Work Order number 6775013. The reason I'm reading the motion now is because it does appear on the um, consent agenda, uh, although it can be removed for further discussion. I, uh... Just get, I, I may want to defer to the town manager and to the uh, superintendent of public works as to whether um, there should be anything in the motion regarding the right of the town to locate wires on the poles. So um, to them for advice. So Paul or Guilford? I'll take that one. Um, and Michael can c correct me if I'm wrong, but the town always has a space on the pole for street lights and for their use. Um, it used to be the fire alarm system, but uh, we also have um, the town fiber runs in that system to connect the town buildings. And, and that is allowed on, that's accounted for in the pole spacing or the spacing on the pole for other services. And we're, we're always, whenever you approve a pole, that's approved in, with the poles. Yeah, that's my impression as well. Uh, when the Eversource admin sends the documentation to the towns, there's some legal ease about uh, having space allocated for existing, you know, alarm systems or, or whatever. So what I'm hearing is that on every poll, the town has space. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. And that would cover the emergency use as well? Yes. yes, I mean, I would. I thought that was, you know, kind of included in the petition. I don't yeah. have the uh, the text in front of me, but I, I thought it was. Okay. Are there further questions from the council? Pam Rooney. Yeah, we were told in a previous Eversource conversation that um, the maximum distance between uh, poles is typically, a, or the max is 150 feet. This looks like it's stretching well beyond that, even with a new pole added. Was there a reason it looks like you're, you're locating this pole outside of a wetland perhaps, um, but our, and that this new pole is to feed the, uh, the solar array that's going to be constructed in the future. Uh, is there a reason that it's not uh, a, a more um, conducive span between existing poles and the new pole? Thank you. Yeah, that it's not shown on that sketch, but there's a uh, like a driveway running, you know, north south, and that's where we needed to place the pole. There's a, a continuation of that pole line going north. And this is uh, like a takeoff pole connecting the existing circuit to the uh, 
the poles that are on customer property. Are there uh, other questions from the council? Okay, I'm not seeing any. So uh, given that, uh, I will go ahead and close the hearing. Um, We now move to general public comment. And let me just state, we already have had budget comments earlier tonight uh, and later on in the evening, we do have one special public comment period on the issue of mosquito opt-out. Um, but I see at this point, several hands up for general public comment. So I'm going to begin with um, Evan, and, and oh, before I start, let me just say, uh, we want to have public comment. However, we will limit it to three minutes. Please watch the clock. And um, when you enter the room, please state your name and where you live. Evan Na Naismith, please enter the room. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Uh, yeah, my name is Evan Naismith, 211 Wildflower Drive. I go by he, his. Um, I'm here to advocate for a stronger, more resilient form of reparations here in Amherst, one that can be replicable elsewhere. I want to advocate against the explicit use of race in the town's reparations initiative. The use of race in any statutory language subjects the legislation to strict scrutiny, which makes it extremely easy to strike down. A colorblind comprehensive review would embrace our black, native, Latino, and other communities. It would be in the tradition of Martin Luther King Jr. as well, who openly advocated for multiracial reparations. When Richmond, Virginia attempted to set aside a portion of its city contracting to black owned businesses, that initiative was struck down by the Supreme Court. Writing for the majority, Sandra Day O'Connor wrote, a generalized assertion that there has been past discrimination cannot justify the use of racial reparations since it provides no guidance for the city's legislative body to determine the precise scope of the injury it seeks to remedy and would allow race-based decision-making essentially limitless in scope and duration. Mm -hmm. The city's argument is flawed in that it is attempting to remedy various forms of past societal discrimination. Now, I don't agree with this regressive Supreme Court decision, but it is nevertheless commandingly instructive regarding our efforts to promote social justice here in Amherst. If an Amherst resident of Native American descent can prove past harm, she should obviously be able to apply for reparations. Please don't doom this initiative by only including one racial group in Amherst's noble reparations legislation. To do so would be damaging to the black community and to the town of Amherst as a whole. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Mattia Kramer. Are you able to hear Who's me? In? Yes, we are. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Mattia Kramer. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm in District 1 here in Amherst. Please permanently dedicate cannabis tax revenue for reparatory justice in Amherst. Amherst has been designated by the Commonwealth's Cannabis Control Commission as a community disproportionately affected by the criminalization of cannabis. And this de designation is unfortunately consistent with reparations for Amherst's research findings. I'm a white resident and a professional researcher and, write and writer, and I helped reparations for Amherst prepare and submit a partial historical timeline of slavery and structural racism in Amherst in December 2020, and a report on anti-Black racism and Black-white disparities in the town of Amherst in March of 2021. A decade of policing statistics in town indicate that Black drivers speed less and are involved in fewer car accidents here, but are stopped, searched, and arrested disproportionately relative to whites. Additionally, the Amherst Pelham Regional School District's own data over the past 30 years show that Black students are disproportionately disciplined relative to their white peers and tracked into lower level courses. 
These are just a couple examples of many troubling findings from our research. Let us please reject the false choice between economic growth and justice. By making this town more equitable and vibrant, we will attract more commerce. So please let us heed the recommendations of the African Heritage Reparations Assembly and permanently dedicate cannabis tax revenue for reparatory justice so that Amherst may achieve the council's stated commitment to end the structural racism that as of today remains deeply rooted in our town. Thank you. Thank you, Mattia. Uh, Matthew Andrews, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Can you hear me? You can. I am Matthew Andrews. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I live in District Two. It's commonly recognized that black and brown people have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. Today as a society, we've acknowledged the faulty premises upon which this war was based and begun to shift our policies. This was a war that lasted decades and destroyed lives and families through incarceration and other acts of state sanctioned violence. Now we're recognizing and reckoning with the consequences, the collateral damage of this war. And the question is, as a society, as we face this reality, what do we do about it? How do we fix all the problems that we created? This is the fundamental question of reparations. When we wake up one day and realize we've caused harm, even though, even through what may have been very good intentions, what is our responsibility to those who we harmed? How do we squarely face ourselves and our errors and correct our course with dignity and sincerity and integrity? These are moral questions that go right to the heart of who we are as a society and what we want to become. This country was founded on audacious ideals and has been unable as yet to realize them. But the past need not determine the future. Instead of despairing over our shortcomings, we can make decisions right now that are rooted in hope and the promise of America's founding ideals. We need leadership right now, and we don't need to wait for this leadership to come from presidents and senators and business tycoons. It can come from you today. You can make a simple, common sense, courageous, hopeful, inspiring decision today that will be a lodestar and a call to others out there who are in a position to shift our collective will in the direction of dignity and integrity, of basic human decency and uprightness. It's commonly recognized that black and brown people have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. And this town has a new revenue stream that directly results from the erosion of the war on drugs. Do the decent and reasonable thing and allocate that money to those who are most impacted by the war. Take a public stand for a future where we honor and respect all people and where we face ourselves and our errors squarely and courageously. Your vote matters and its implications will ripple out into the future. On behalf of all those who believe in the future of this country and maintain hope that its founding ideals will be realized, I thank you. Thank you for joining us. Jim Lachaud, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello, my name's Jim Lesko, you can hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm an executive director of Amherst Media. 246 College Street, Amherst. I want to uh, tonight thank the council for putting Amherst Media on your agenda back in April 25th and the discussion that was uh, very much appreciated by the, us here at Amherst Media, the board of directors, the staff, and our members. One of the things that was discussed that night was looking into the reuse of town and vacant buildings for a possible temporary relocation while we wait to build our new building. As most people know, Eversource has evicted us and we need to be out by the end of June of this year. South Campus School was mentioned as a possibility that, in, that evening and one to be investigated. We were very excited about the location uh, due to that proximity to the, uh, the close proximity to Munson Library and the opportunity to help bring activities, cultural and uh, educational to the uh, South Amherst neighborhoods community, one which has one of the highest concentration of low income families in the town. We also want you to understand that 
when we're looking, I think there were some uh, people that mentioned that it's not the town's responsibility. You're right, it's not. It's Amherst Media's responsibility for its relocation, but it has to be mutually agreed upon with our contract with the town. The town has to provide the connectivity for us to be able to continue with our internet and to connect us with cable back out to Comcast. So when we were looking, we wanted to take a look. We asked back in March uh, 2nd to take a look at the property and we were told that uh, there was a report being developed. We were able to get in there today for the first time and we're met with the, uh, biz the building commissioner, Rob Moore, and the assistant town manager, David Zomack. We were told the report might be ready by this Friday. I gotta be honest with you, the property is doable. It's reuse is doable, but because of the delays and because of the, the lack of time that we have, I fear unless the town was able to get an extension of by Eversource to keep us here while we did the work needed, that we would not be able to, to get in there in the time that we needed with everything that needs to be done. But is it a reusable space? Absolutely. We will know Friday whether or not uh, what the actual cost is. It would be good for you as a town to know. But it's also, I was very disheartened at the same time to hear by the assistant town manager say, the plans for that building is for to demolish it when you're not using it anymore. Our commitment was to put money into that so that other organizations could go in there when we move on. So I, I'm encouraging as a group to really look at your buildings, the underutilization, and to try to get this back into a, a, a real sense of community. Thank you for your time. Martha Hanner, please enter the room and state your name and where you live. I'm Martha Hanner from District 5. I'm speaking on the behalf of the Amherst League of Women Voters. We invite everyone in Amherst to come to join us for a community reception at Groff Park this Sunday afternoon, May 22nd from 3 to 5 p.m to welcome the leaders of our two new town departments, the Community Responders for Equity, Safety and Service, CRESS, and the Department of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, DEI, whose new director we are hoping you will confirm this very evening. And I must say that uh, although she's not beginning until July, she has uh, changed her plans in order to be present on Sunday. So it will be a first opportunity uh, to talk with her. And, uh, we in the League believe that the creation of CRESS and DEI uh, can mark the start for a new era that will help to bring equity and inclusion, and as the previous speaker said tonight, dignity and integrity for all of our residents, and that this truly is a cause for celebration. <laughs> we'll have great music, good food, and good conversation, so it's an opportunity for everyone to come to show your support, learn about these new programs and voice your ideas directly to the individuals who will make it happen. So please bring your family, bring your friends and we invite you all to join us on this Sunday afternoon at Groff Park. Thank you. Martha, thank you. Adam Fink, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello, counselors, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, my name is Adam Fink, and I'm a, I'm a resident of District 2. And I'm a member of the Amherst community and the organizer for the Multidisciplinary Psychedelic Club at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I'm here to share my support for the resolution protecting adult access to plant medicines. I support this act because plant medicines have been integral to my healing journey. During my teenage years, I experienced severe treatment-resistant depression and suicidal ideation. Thankfully, I was able to have a set of experiences with psilocybin mushrooms and psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, which served as a powerful medicine to heal my mental health issues. My life was immediately changed by these experiences. I was able to not only get by, but thrive and live my life. My story is but one of thousands. Plant medicines have been shown in dozens of rigorous peer-reviewed studies from John Hawkins University and UC Berkeley to be highly effective in treating a whole range of mental health illness like depression, anxiety, and addiction. In one study, 
Over half of participants saw remission in their depression symptoms with continual well-being being reported over six months later. This is from a single experience with psilocybin mushrooms. This is far more effective than any current medicine available today. Our country is facing a mental health crisis. Suicide is the second most common cause of death among young adults in the U.S. By passing the resolution protecting adult access to plant we'll be taking an important step in creating a healthier, happier community and saving lives in the town of Amherst. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Adam. Adam Clem, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, counselors, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Adam Clem and uh, I'm a constituent also in District 2 of Amherst. And uh, to echo what uh, my friend Adam Fink says, uh, I'm speaking in support of the plant medicine resolution uh, which prioritizes mental health services uh, rather than arrests for substance possession. Um, I know this resolution is going to be voted on very shortly uh, just in this meeting. So uh, I, along with Adam, just want to leave you with a few thoughts before your vote. This resolution has been passed unanimously in Cambridge, Somerville, East Hampton, and Northampton. And tonight, Amherst has an opportunity to lead the way with an equally, if not more, ambitious resolution. For me personally, as an aspiring therapist who's starting uh, work in a rehab just next week, I find it essential that we change our view of these powerful psychedelic medicines, which can treat addiction and mental health crises at incredible rates. This year has been one of the worst years for overdoses and mental health on record. Rates of depression and PTSD are at an all-time high. And our state is even more disproportionately affected by this crisis compared to the national average of overdoses. This crisis really does demand a new and powerful approach, and that can absolutely come in the form of these plant medicines and an overall approach to stop arrests for substance possession. Just to share a few short facts about psychedelic medicines and their therapeutic efficacy. A 2017 study showed that just a single experience with magic mushrooms reduces the risk of opioid use by 40 to 50 percent. This is truly unlike anything we currently have, and it's exactly the kind of revolutionary approach we would need uh, to combat this crisis. Um, just on the more scientific level, other studies show these plants have the power to form new brain connections, which we call neurogenesis. And this explains the success at treating uh, mental illness and addiction. When we consider these facts, respectfully, we, we shouldn't be arresting citizens for using compounds that have these benefits. And a compound which is not only non-addictive, but is even anti-addictive as it has such an efficacy at treating addiction. And by decriminalizing, uh, we can open up opportunities for those that need to use compounds safely and for further education on safe use, which has just been shut down for so long. And just as a final note, uh, our most vulnerable and even people we consider the heroes of our society, such as traumatized veterans and first responders, uh, could benefit even more so uh, from incredible medicines like these to treat trauma and uh, to help integrate them back into their incredible societal roles. So thank you for your help. And I really encourage you to consider this on the vote tonight. Thank you. Ruth Hazard, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, uh, thank you. My name is Ruth Hazard. I live on Pine Street in District 1. Um, I am a member, I'm speaking in really, uh, as a member of two faith communities in the area. I'm a member of Hopping Tree Sangha, which is a Buddhist community of practice under the guidance of Thich Nhat Hanh. This has been meeting in Amherst for thir more than 30 years. I'm also a member of Mount Toby Friends Meeting, where my ministry in racial justice has been recognized and supported by my meeting. In both faith communities, we have been we have dedicated groups working on understanding and changing systemic racism. We've studied the rationale and the need and the means for reparations to African-Americans 
and we support the serious commitment that the town of Amherst is making toward reparations. There are so many areas where repair of past harm done is needed. The task is large. One of the most important we feel is housing. Public policy, practice and resources were instrumental in barring back black families from building generational wealth through home ownership. Thus, it is right that public policy and resources be dedicated to opening home ownership to black families. In Amherst, especially, uh, this is a moral task that will require a major investment. To succeed, it requires a significant and reliable revenue stream. The new revenue that's available from cannabis taxes will do this. Given the historic injustice of the criminal justice system's incarceration of black individuals for marijuana possession and the predominance of white entrepreneurs gaining money from cannabis sales, this represents a moral policy of fairness and repair. So I'm urging the council tonight to support the funding request for 100% of cannabis revenue going to reparations as recommended by the African Heritage Reparations Assembly. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ruth. Mary Porcino, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. All right, can you hear me? We can. Great. Okay, so hello, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, my name is Mary Porcino. I live at 120 Pulpit Hill Road in North Amherst, and I have been actively involved in research and writing and educational projects for reparations for Amherst for the past few years. But I am speaking um, to you tonight on behalf of 30 residents of my neighborhood in North Amherst who have signed a petition uh, and by the way, I anticipate um, 20 to 30 more signatures by the end of the week, and I will get that petition to you. The petition is in support of what we view as an important opportunity for the council to uh, continue its exemplary racial justice work on a new front, and that is the use of tax revenues uh, from cannabis sales to bolster the town's reparation project. I have found my neighbors to be genuinely proud of the exemplary leadership the council has taken to support action on reparations, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and community safety for people of color. Municipalities across the country will be looking to Amherst for continued leadership in how we handle this unprecedented opportunity to use with care the money being generated by the booming new legal cannabis industry. As you know, uh, for the five decades after marijuana was criminalized, we saw a staggering racial bias in enforcement. Black Americans were arrested and incarcerated at rates nearly four times higher than whites who had nearly identical uh, rates of marijuana use. So now that the tables have turned and we are welcoming cannabis shops throughout our town, using cannabis tax revenues to build our reparations fund is a further step the council might take to demonstrate what justice for all looks like. Your vote to earmark these funds to invest in the individuals in the communities who have been disproportionately harmed by the war on drugs would send a powerful message. To my neighbors and I, and we hope to you as well, it seems abundantly clear that cannabis revenues need to be spent first on those most unjustly targeted, whose lives and families' lives deserve to be the focus of our investments, taking into account the need for restorative justice as we begin to distribute these new revenues. The town council has in front of it such an important opportunity to set precedent as the legal cannabis industry comes online across the country. 
your vote could be yet another step which Amherst takes to model uh, what it takes for a, mun a municipality to move towards justice for people who have been denied justice for so long. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Amakar Shabazz. Can you hear us? Dr. Shabazz, can you hear us? Amakar? Uh, we're having connectivity. Ah, oh, there we go. Can you hear us? I think is he having connectivity problems? It looks like it. It looks like there's some sort of audio issue. Um, we can come back to Dr. Shabazz to allow him time to test his microphone. Okay, um, we will come back to you. Uh, Dr. Dimitria Tria Shabazz, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello? Yeah, hi there. Hi, um, we're, we're juggling sound issues. Um, so thank you. I would wish to address uh, several issues, uh, just two at the moment, regarding the budget and the use of funds in the town of Amherst that supports projects that do not benefit BIPOC people, youth, nor seniors who are in need of kind of subsidized housing and who may be people of color or where English is not their first language. Uh, in other words, folks who are marginalized in this community to some extent. First, Amherst Media, like the Jones Library, needs your support. And there have been, uh, you know, in terms of energy, so much expended in supporting the Jones Library. I'm not arguing that perhaps uh, it does not need our support as a community, but Amherst Media, like the Jones Library, is the keeper of stories. Amherst Media has been moving forward in realizing after 46 years in how we serve the residents that we needed a permanent home. And in 2013, when the property on Main and Gray became available, we made a decision as a board, um, such folks as, you know, uh, Tony Maroulis was on the board at the time, um, that we had to move forward and be self-sufficient and sustainable. So it's taken us several years to secure proper certifications and approvals. We've continued to pay taxes to the town and adhere to all the laws and regulations that we as a nonprofit are supposed to. And although our role providing government transparency through broadcasting meetings, um, that has been discussed in, in a meeting, thank you. But we give voice to the voiceless uh, in terms of the public and the residents of this community. That's our role. We provide a platform for young people, such as the high school film club that currently meets on the College Street address, uh, or editing services for the series History Bites, or bone health exercise program for seniors, which we broadcast, or our award-winning show, Curious Giraffe. So not to mention the cultural events, the many cultural events we have covered over the years. Uh, such as Juneteenth, and usually without any compensation. I personally have hosted free workshops for youth, um, art workshops, climate change workshops, etc. So to end, my point, 
is that the use of vacant town buildings paid for with our taxes, such as the South Amherst School, makes sense not only for us temporarily, but for other struggling nonprofits that, like us, have been negatively impacted during COVID. A project such as the BIPOC Youth Empowerment Center or the Multicultural Center advocated by the CSWG and residents could, for instance, use the space until funds could be secured to have other alternatives. After all, how much money, and I'm ending, after all, how much money has been budgeted to eliminate these properties? Why not use them? That makes better fiscal sense. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Peter, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, I'm Peter Blood. I live on Jenks Street in District 2. Um, I come from an organization called Interfaith Opportunities Network, which I'm the co-convener of, and which represents 10 of the 12 faith congregations within the uh, limits of Amherst. Uh, we've been really coming to grips as faith communities as ones across the country have since the death of George Floyd with the truth of the tremendous damage done to uh, people of the heritage of um, chattel slavery. And um, we actually, ironically, a year exactly a year ago today, we had a gathering uh, sponsored by ION, which uh, featured two speakers on the issue of faith roots of reparational justice. And one of the two speakers there was the Reverend Dr. Jacqueline Smith Crooks, who's a long-term Amherst resident of African-American um, race. And uh, we had representatives of all of the faith congregations in ION. Um, they were there, over 60 people took part and looked very deeply at the reasons for uh, taking a reparations approach to dealing with past harm. And what the people from all different faith congregations talked about at that session was that you cannot simply face the truth of harm done if you're not willing to actually do the actions to make repair for what has happened. Enormous damage has been done to all kinds of people of color, but particularly for Amherst to our African-American population because we had a large proportion of African-Americans in this town from the very beginning who suffered great, great harm because of their African-American background and continue to do today for some of the reasons that have already been explained, like the ways in which African-Americans have been arrested in different uh, numbers. My son went to Amherst High School and had many African-American friends, he's white. And when he would walk around town, for instance, on UMass campus, police would come up and question his African-American friends and he was standing right with them and he would that not question my son. And that just shows the kind of tragedy that still happens. Um, we have an extraordinary opportunity to take a courageous step towards a de dedicated funding stream to make reparations really begin on an active basis here in Amherst. We Hopefully that will be picked up by groups across the country, across the state, across the nation, and ultimately through HR 40 on the federal level to really have a reckoning of repair for the enormous damage that's done. We won't be able to heal these injuries that have re were revealed by what just happened in Buffalo until we begin to take action to undo the harm that was done. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, Peter. Jeffrey Gold, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Um, my name is Jeff Gold. I live on Harkness Road and I'm speaking for uh, myself and Devorah Jacobson. We are the co-chairs of the Reparations Committee of the Jewish Community of Amherst. And we wholeheartedly <clears throat> and strongly support the AHRA's request of the Amherst Town Council to, des to designate 100% of the can cannabis tax revenue collected from local cannabis retail establishments for the designated use of reparations for Amherst. The obvious and well-known precedent for this idea comes from Evanston, Illinois reparations program, which as you no doubt know, after years of pain painstaking efforts and planning, just recently began distributing 
their first reparations tax monies to eligible applicants through a variety of housing related initiatives. We have followed the efforts of the AHRA and reparations for Amherst and feel the current request makes sense on many levels, including the long history of people of color being so severely harmed by the criminalization of cannabis and its unequal enforcement in this country. And more specifically to Amherst, the Cannabis Control Committee has designated 29 communities in Massachusetts that have been disproportionately impacted by the criminalization of marijuana. Amherst is one of these towns. The need for reparative justice in Amherst is obvious. Such tax revenue would assist in funding reparations related projects and is aligned with the town council's own previously stated commitment to address structural racism in our community. We join the AHRA in appealing to you, the town council, to provide the moral leadership on this critical issue and help repair past harms and injustices to people of African heritage in Amherst by designating the cannabis tax revenue for use for reparative justice programs in this town. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Ash Hartwell, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Good. So I'm Ash Hartwell. I live on Redgate Lane in District 5. And uh, thank you for, I, I think much has already been said tonight by um, Matteo and Matthew Andrews and Ruth Hazard and Jeff and Mary about, uh, and Peter Blood about the, uh, about the importance of uh, reparative justice and uh, the importance of really taking seriously the notion that uh, is expressed in the resolution of uh, 2020 that, uh, that the town affirms its uh, commitment to end structural racism and achieve racial equity for black residents. And um, reparations is one means of doing this. And it, as, as has been argued, and I won't try to restate the reasons that the use of cannabis funds for that makes an enormous amount of sense because of the harm that um, the cannabis uh, um, arrests and incarceration have caused uh, uh, the black population. Um, I think too that we recognize that, as somebody has said that, uh, uh, Cornel West, that uh, love is what justice looks like when it's made public. And I think that the, the moral path of caring and recognizing the spiritual roots of reparative justice is, is something that if we, if we can, can reach consensus about that in the town, will cause everyone's well-being. Um, and, and so I, I strongly support the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the work that is going on by the, uh, by the new CRESS and DEI department, which is just getting started. I don't see these things as in competition. They should be seen as in synchrony and working together. Um, but one way or the other, the town needs to find funds and support so that it becomes a part of the regular budget to, to put into practice the, um, the implementation of its resolution of creating greater justice and uh, racial equity. I'm gonna stop there because I think that much has been said and I, I, I'd like to support the motion from that comes from the um, Amherst Heritage Reparations Assembly, the African um, Heritage Reparations Assembly. Thank you. Thank you, Ash. Um, Ella Landman, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello, my name is Ella Landman, living in um, District 2. And before handing it off to someone with technical difficulties, I just want to say that 
I'm in support of the resolution protecting adult access to plant medicines due to many of the reasons that Adam Clem and Adam Fink have already stated. Um, but I'll just hand it off to Helen. Hi, um, my name is Helen. I go to UMass Amherst. I am an organizer of the Psychedelic Club and I am full on supporting um, the use of plant medicine by um, adult citizens. And I think that in general, in society, we need a larger push towards um, research as well as looking into how these medicines can help, um, particularly in therapy and psychiat psychiatric practices. Um, I personally am pre-med and I have a very like um, holistic view of medical care. And I really want to see our healthcare system become more um, inclusive of these methods and I've worked in a pharmacy and I know that half of the medication I'm giving to people is so mm -hmm. much worse for their health than let's say um prunes or any other type of substance of that particular uh realm um and I feel the same way about alcohol um and just yeah I want more push I want more open-mindedness and I want more technical research to make it legit to use plant medicine for recreation and um, have more education about it. Thank you, Helen. Do you have anything else to say? Um, um, not really. I'm just really glad that these things are being talked about. And um, I love Psychedelic Club at UMass Amherst. And I want to use that like passion in my career as well, um, hopefully when I become a doctor. All right. Well, back to me, Ella Landman. I would just like to say that as a neuroscience student, I'm very interested in all of the benefits of psychedelics and the ability to grow new neural pathways, which is astonishing. In addition to helping with mental health disorders where they're so stuck in the specific neural pathway that they cannot break from, it is also being looked into as a treatment for Alzheimer's. So just all of the neuronal growth that can come from this plant medicine is exceptional. And I would love to see and participate in more research. So I really do support um, allowing access to plant medicines and ultimately decriminalizing um, these psychedelics. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ella and Helen. Uh, James Davis, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I may soon become a resident of Amherst. I'm out there about every weekend. Uh, Lynn, I look forward to being your constituent uh, pretty soon. And I also had the opportunity to trip sit for a young woman, a mom in District 3 this last weekend and uh, lead Bay Staters, which is the group that has worked with four cities to decriminalize these plant medicines. I almost lost my brother to an overdose last year, and this has been the deadliest year in history with opioid overdoses in our country. A single use of psilocybin, which is non-addictive, reduces the risk of opiate addiction by 40 to 55%. These plants are non-addictive. We have used them for thousands of years. There were thousands of studies published on them even prior to the year 1950. What happened in 1971 is the Nixon administration to penalize anti-war opponents and people of color scheduled both cannabis and these psychedelic compounds as schedule one narcotics. The result of that has been five decades of terror on black and brown communities in particular. In Oregon, which decriminalized possession of all controlled substances, their criminal justice commission projects there's been a 95% decrease in racial inequalities and arrests. And we've seen these racial inequalities and how these arrests play out throughout the Commonwealth with our public records request showing a two to one racial disparity in cities like Springfield and Boston. I'll add too that these, these compounds are going to get integrated into our society. It's only a matter of how and when. There are pharmaceutical companies that are trying to patent synthetic versions and charge nearly $15,000 at a time when the average American cannot afford a $500 expense. 
So tonight, if you have anxieties about cannabis or anxieties about how people are going to use psychedelics, let me just say that criminalizing them is the worst way to address those anxieties. Um, in fact, psychedelics help people with cannabis use disorder who are misusing that substance. Um, psychedelics are also really effective in helping people get off much more harmful drugs like alcohol, uh, which the Lancet found is the most harmful drug of all, yet is sold at every single corner store in Massachusetts. So I understand if you want more information, we've tried to provide as much information and testimony as we can, but criminalization only makes use less controlled. It leads to fewer conversations between doctors and patients and fewer conversations between young people and their parents. So thank you, and I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Kathleen Anderson, uh, there are three more people who are making public comment, and that's where we're going to end. We'll start with Kathleen Anderson. Okay. Thank you very much for your time this evening. I hope you can hear me. Yes? We can. Okay, great. Uh, Kathleen Anderson, I live in District 7. I am supporting and asking the um, council to uh, uh, support the cannabis revenue for the African Heritage Reparations Assembly. I want to um, not repeat everything that other people have said in terms of supporting this action. I do want to remind us that reparations has been paid to white people and has been continuing and supporting their uh, wealth and abundance. And it's time that the black people, the African heritage people whose labor uh, is responsible for the wealth of this country, it is time for reparations to be paid to that group of people. So I just want to say that I want you to support the um, cannabis tax funds to be uh, used to support the African Heritage Assembly, reparations assemblies efforts. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Bella, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. My name is actually Victoria Hubs. I live in South Amherst on Hulst Road. I grew up in this town, having come here with my parents in 1970, both founding members of Hampshire College. Having discovered from personal experience the power of natural healing, I want to put forth my voice in favor of the decriminalization of plant medicine. The positive benefits have been proven in countless scientific studies. Given the current global crisis we are all experiencing, I feel that we need to use all that is all the resources that are available to us for the healing of the humanity that's certainly in need right now. And I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Courtney, Courtney Cullen, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Hi, my name is Courtney Cullen, she, her pronouns. I live at 422 Pine Street. Um, I'm here to ask you to vote in favor of calling on Joe Biden to eliminate all student debt. Um, I want you to tell you my story because it is not unique. Uh, I am a first generation college student, a woman who grew up in poverty in Appalachia. I had no college counseling, uh, but a drive to make a better life for myself. I completed my undergraduate degree in 2008 and my master's degree at UMass in 2012. I left with $80,000 in debt, which has now ballooned to $115,000. I taught as a pre preschool teacher for nine and a half years in nonprofit preschools making poverty wages in hopes of having my debt forgiven through the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Act, just to learn that I would not be eligible, nor would my loans be forgiven in spite of making all of my payments on time. I am unfortunately not alone. 
Uh, I am not unique in this. The system is broken. And I am calling on Joe Biden to cancel all and not a portion of student debt. One cannot thrive under this kind of debt when education should be free. Thank you. Courtney, thank you. Uh, Dr. Amakar Shabazz has reconnected, and so we're going to ask him to enter the room, and this will be the final comment. Thank you. Am I audible? You are. This is Amilkar Shabazz. I am uh, in South Amherst, right off of Bay Road. And uh, I also serve uh, at your pleasure on the uh, African Heritage Reparations Assembly. Um, we are so glad that this um, uh, issue of earmarking cannabis tax revenues are, uh, is before you now and that you will uh, hopefully deliberate and vote uh, per our recommendation to begin to earmark 100% of these revenues toward um, uh, the reparative justice program that we are developing. In about a year's time, we hope to have for you a comprehensive plan as to how we recommend the town should move forward. We hope by that time as well, many things have been worked out, such as uh, the efforts going to the state legislature for home rule legislation to proceed in a completely legal way that is unimpeachable, unchallengeable, even, a, even toward this current Supreme Court uh, that is trying to take uh, women's reproductive rights away, um, that, uh, that we will be clear that in the same way that uh, Japanese people who um, faced internment during the Second World War, who for many years did not want to pursue any kind of, of reparative justice for the uh, pain and the anguish and the death that they in, uh, that they experienced and their families experienced, but around some in the 1970s, they they then did begin to coalesce to uh, to to organize for reparations, which then came about in the 80s. And none of this was deemed then nor now as in violation of 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 laws that. Um, the previous uh, a previous speaker was referring to that has to do with challenges to affirmative action. This is a completely different area, and we're taking all steps with uh, state legislation to make this a com to develop a plan that is completely legal that will come before you in about a year's time. But we need this revenue stream to be dedicated to begin to build the fund base necessary. Thank you for your support. Dr. Shabazz, thanks for joining us. That's going to conclude public comment. Uh, we have 32 people in the audience and we're going to return now to our um, consent agenda. We're gonna place it on the screen. Uh, let me just state that the following items were selected because they were considered to be routine. In many cases voted unanimously in committee. Um, and if you would like to remove an item after I go through the initial motion before it's seconded, we'll ask you to do so. Uh, to move the following items in printed motions thereunder and approve those items as a single unit. 6A, adoption of Memorial Day Proclamation. 6B, adoption of proclamation recognizing June as lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, LGBTQ Pride Month. Adoption of resolution calling on President Joe Biden to immediately cancel all student loan debt. Adoption of resolution protecting adult access to plant medicine and priorities prioritizing public health responses to controlled substance possession. 8A, approval of Eversource petition to install a joint owned poll on the north side of West Pomeroy Lane across from 72 West Pomeroy Lane between two existing poles. 8D, approval of proposed and interim parking regulations on, on North Pleasant Street from Triangle to Halleck Street. And 8E, acceptance of optional tax exemptions. 9A, waiver of 
Town Council Rules of Procedure, Rule 8.6 for Agenda Item 9A, Approval of Town Manager Appointment of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Director, and 9A, Approval of Town Manager Appointment of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Director. Let me just mention that later on during the town manager's report, there'll be an opportunity for him to talk more about that proposed appointment. I need to just adjust my screen. And I want to call on Mandy Jo Haneke. Um, I'm asking to remove items 6C, adoption of resolution, calling on President Joe Biden to immediately cancel all student loan debt. 6D, adoption of resolution protecting adult access to plant medicines and prioritizing public health responses to controlled substance abuse, uh, substance possession, sorry about that. And 8D, approval of proposed and interim parking regulations on North Pleasant Street from Triangle to Halleck Street. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other hands? I see none at the time. So the motion now reads to move the following items and the printed motions thereunder and approve those items as a single unit. I'm just gonna use the number 6A, 6B, 8A, 8E, 9A waiver and 9A approval. Is there a second? Second, Devlin Gothier. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I'm going to go to a roll call vote. Uh, Shalini Balmilne? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Yes. Lynn Grace Mers, aye. Mandy Johanneke? Aye. Anika Lopes? Aye. Michelle Miller? Yes. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Alicia Walker? Yes. It's unanimous. All right, we're going to um, move on to the resolution for the Memorial Day Proclamation. The sponsors for this are Lynn Grease, our counselors Lynn Greesmer, Anika Lopes, and Dorothy Pam. And Anika, please read the final sentence of uh, paragraphs. Now, therefore, we, the Amherst Town Council, hereby proclaim May 30th, 2022, to be Memorial Day and urge all residents of Amherst to recognize the sacrifice of past residents and observe this day in remembrance of them. Thank you. Uh, uh, with regard to the proclamation recognizing June as lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, plus LGBTQ plus Pride Month, uh, the sponsors for this, the council sponsors are Councillor DeAngelis and Anna Devlin Gothier, and the community sponsor is former town councillor Evan Ross. Uh, Pat, would you please read the last? paragraph or two, and also just state that we are still trying to solidify the final date, okay? I, before I do that, I wanna say there are two errors in the last two, be it further proclaimed. It says, be if, be if, I thought that was caught in GOL, uh, but it should be caught before um, this goes out. Thank you. Um, and whereas we affirm our support for our lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer plus residents and stand with them to protect their civil rights and ability to live openly without fear. Now, therefore, we, the Amherst Town Council, do hereby proclaim June 2022 as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer plus Pride Month. Be it further proclaim we, the Amherst Town Council, encourage all residents to celebrate and affirm our proud and diverse LGBTQ plus community year round. Be it further proclaimed, this proclamation will be recognized 
by raising the pride flag on the UN flagpole from June 2nd to June 30th, 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the resolution calling on President Joe Biden to immediately cancel all student debt was taken off the consent agenda. Uh, I would like to ask, um, I'm sorry. Is there a comment? Okay. No, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, first of all, GOL, uh, Michelle, do you have a report on this with regard to the vote? Um, I'm sorry. Can you ask that one more time, Lynn, a report on the which resolution one? calling on jo President Joe Biden to immediately cancel all student loan debt? Yes, that was unanimously voted as clear, consistent and actionable. OK. Uh, and um, Mandy Jo, you were the person that asked that it be removed. So I'm going to call on you first. Okay. I ask that it be removed because I can't support um, a call to cancel all student debt. Um, there's evidence that canceling all federal student debt doesn't actually decrease the wealth gap. In fact, it might increase it. Um, the resolution itself indicates that canceling student debt would um, decrease racial and gender wage disparities, but canceling something that's already debt, I'm not sure how it relates to wages. Um, canceling all student debt, as some recent editorials and other research has shown, may actually make the problem worse in the future by encouraging more debt in anticipation of another debt amnesty. And the $1.7 trillion that it would cost the government to cancel all student debt could better be spent on targeted income-based programs to really help those who need it, including those who have never attended college and have low-wage jobs those who have attended college but are still in need of help, and children who have seen universal free lunch programs and increased child tax credits massively decrease their food insecurity. And, and so for that reason, I can't support this resolution. Okay. Dorothy Pam, you have your hand up. I support the resolution because as the speaker said, um, the system is a complete shambles. Students who have been working in nonprofit public service jobs have found out that, oh, they weren't being counted. Um, the, it, it's, it's a, it has turned out to be a terrible, terrible trick on young people. So we now have a whole generation of people, two generations, unable to move forward with their adult life as they are completely weighed down and burdened by this debt. Um, when I think back on the college debt I had, it was nothing. It was nothing because college didn't cost what it costs now. And when you went to a state university, you didn't pay an arm and a leg. So we are now in a very, very broken system. And I think that this is one way to help young people move forward so they can be productive adult citizens. Thank you. Kathy Shane. If, if Mandy had not asked to have it be withdrawn from consent, I would have. Um, I agree with everything Mandy said, and I will try not to repeat it, but I want to take a big picture look. I think um, when we, uh, we all know the issue of debt is a crushing problem and that we're not managing it well in the United States, but giving away federal resources that can be well targeted is not a solution. And we've been doing this. We're, we're, undermining in our ability to do early child care, um, other kinds of reforms with quick reactions. This does not even address the problem of what about next year? What about new debt? And the, the New York Times editorial that I sent to everyone also cited the Brookings study. And I just think it's extremely bad policy to go this route. Um, and part of it is because doing the right thing seems to be difficult. That doesn't mean you give away several billions of dollars because doing fixing the system and administering it correctly and plugging the loopholes in it, you know, and include, I, you know, what I want to specifically reference is under the last administration, uh, the, the students that were treated really badly were the ones that went to for-profit institutions and never got an education. They The classes weren't offered and then they had the debt. So there was fraud and we should be going after the fraud rather than doing this broad acts report. So I would support a much more targeted, well-worded 
policy statement. I don't think this resolution is that. Shalini? Yeah, <clears throat> I support uh, fixing the system and agree with what's been said that um, just um, canceling all debt is not going to solve the problem and it's going to create more burden and not really uh, generate resources to fix the problem and direct it towards people who really need it. So I would encourage the sponsors to come back with a more targeted uh, plan and, for example, Senator Warren's plan, which is more targeted, offering a tiered approach and it's based on income, but I've also heard maybe we should be considering wealth and not income. So just creating some kind of criteria and a more targeted approach that really addresses and makes sure that the people who really need it are getting the support and not um, people who can afford fancy lawyers and coaches who can cons who can teach them how to you know uh, avoid uh, the the loans and whatnot. Thank you so much, Michelle Miller. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to hear from the sponsors on this. Usually um, the framework is that we would hear from the, the sponsors. And um, so I, I would like to hear um, from any of the sponsors who are willing to speak to this. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking for sponsors to raise hands. Alicia. Um, <clears throat> sorry, thank you. Um, I was one of the sponsors and I wanted to um, appreciate everyone's comments and um, opinions on this. And I just have a couple of responses. Um, and so along with the other counselors and our um, community sponsor, I think we realize that this is not the, the long-term solution that we're looking for. Um, and I don't think that we intended this to be the long-term solution that's going to serve, that's going to solve the educational systems problems for years to come. However, I think we see it as a first step. And so while I hear Kathy and Mandy Jo, and I don't disagree, I think two things can be true at the same time, and that both things are equally important. While we cancel student loan debt that is existing for all people who have current student loan debt that is quite bearing of opportunities and prosperity, that we also come up with a long-term solution that will fix the problem for people to come afterward, because on the other side of that is the same thing. If we just create a solution for the long-term, then we are missing all of the people who currently have the debt. Um, and so what are the ways in which we can address this situation that already exists, but then also create a plan moving forward? And so while I understand this is only one piece, I believe this is the first step. Um, and I, I would like some, if anyone's willing to offer, um, elaboration on how this could worsen the problem, because that's something that I don't understand. Um, I understand some of the other concerns about it not being a full encompassing solution, um, but I don't foresee this being something that will worsen the issue. Um, and so I welcome any other sponsors to also respond and um, to engage in conversation with some other counselors. Andy, you are one of those sponsors. Please go yes. ahead. I was not an original co-sponsor, but I joined after the first introduction to the council. And I had some of the same thoughts initially that have been expressed this evening. Ultimately, um, I felt and still feel that this is the right thing to do. We're not passing policy in this one. We're stating um, a, a preference to get attention of our elected officials and press them to move in a direction to address a serious problem. And as I've uh, said to a couple of uh, the co-sponsors, I came at this originally because as my prior role as director of Western Massachusetts Legal Aid Program, uh, what I was finding is, is that people were graduating from law school and they could not apply for jobs in um, a legal aid or public interest setting because the loan debt was so overwhelming that it was not a career choice open to them. And uh, it was affecting us in many ways, not least of which was that we always desire in a program such as a legal aid program to have a uh, workforce 
that reflects the people who are being served by the organization. And that was frankly impossible when you start applying the student loan problem to it. And um, of course, um, there was um, hope that there would be some kind of program that would um, allow for forgiving student loan debt for people who are doing public interest work. That was never, it was um, enacted, but never really um, put into place in any meaningful way. And uh, which is sort of why I um, am concerned about saying that a targeted approach to solving the problem is gonna is the better way to go because uh, there have been targeted approaches that have been tried for years now and have been totally unsuccessful. And as we know from the last administration are left to the whim of whoever is in uh, the administration at the time. And for all of those reasons, um, I felt that it was important to be able to make a statement to get the attention um, of our legislators as to why this is such an important issue. Okay, I'm gonna go on to other sponsors that have their hands raised. Anna Devlin Gothier. I thought I'd have more time to prep. Okay, so uh, this is a hard, this is a hard conversation to, for me to engage in because this is something that's so uh, personal. As, as many of, of us know, there are lots of resolutions that are really personal. And while I'm not comfortable sharing my own financial information in a public town council meeting, I need you all to know that this is deeply personal uh, to me. That doesn't need to impact your vote. I'm just telling you. A um, couple things that I wanted to cite, you know, I mean, I think that it's, it's challenging because we supplied you with resources and, and studies that uh, demonstrated support um, for why student debt cancellation is beneficial. Uh, when student debt is erased, a large, a large burden is lifted. And I can't, I mean, I can't even tell you the, the stress that student debt has on people impacts their health. Um, it doesn't just impact their li lives, it impacts their health. It impacts their ability and desire to take risks uh, financially. It impacts their ability to financially afford to have children or buy a home or buy a car. Um, they're not contributing to the economy in the same way that they would if they didn't have you know, those, those monthly payments. Um, targeted programs would be great and we have seen decades of targeted programs not working. Uh, you, we have heard from the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program about the immense failures of its its uh, of that program. Um, you know the argument that uh, that couldn't that 1.7 be spent on targeted populations pitting these funds against each other is an unfair comparison. You could say that about any other spending, and right, like you could say that about the defense budget, maybe. Um, I mean, that's I don't I don't buy that argument. Sorry. Um, so. And then the other part is that we are going after fraudulent, uh, fraudulent institutions. Maura Healy has made that one of her, one of her, you know, big issues. Um, that is happening on the state and federal level. So, you know, I think this is something that uh, folks who see their debt erased seek higher paying jobs. They're more willing to take a risk and apply for some, a new job or do something that they might not have if they knew that they couldn't go a month without an income because they wouldn't be able to make their student loan payment. People are living incredibly tightly because of these loans. Um, and yes, that's tied to other structures and systems like educating people on what debt means, but that wouldn't do anything for the people who hold debt now. Free college doesn't do anything for the people who hold debt now. That's what we need to do in addition, but it's not right now. I know, I know, I see the timer, but it's not, um, it's not going to help the people who currently hold the debt. I also just want to note, we do have our community sponsor here, um, and I'd really love to bring him in if that's okay, because um, I'm sure he also has eloquent answers to these. Um, Athena, it's Ian. He has his hand raised, if you if that's okay. Um, and I also, you know, I think this resolution has been before you all for a long time. If these are really deep issues, I, I do wish that we'd had time to really engage in discussion. I, I want to appreciate Andy for, for doing that with us as well. Thank you. Um, the community sponsor, Ian Roadwalt, Roadwalt is Ian Roadwalt. In, yes, Ian Road. I'm sorry, Ian Roadwalt is in the audience. Uh, Ian, would you like to make a comment 
if you do, please enter the room, state your name. And please keep your comments to as short as you can. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm just trying to refigure some of the comments that I, I had written down um, previously, but I'm going to start with this, that in this moment of profound uh, intersecting compounding crises from the pandemic to the tearing away of women's rights by the Supreme Court to the ongoing white supremacist terrorist violence in this country that we see in Buffalo and elsewhere to the shortage of baby formula nationally, um, we need to understand the ways in which policy, policy choices create poverty and exacerbate poverty. Um, policy choices such as those that have created the student debt crisis are a form of structural violence that overwhelmingly targets women and particularly black women. Um, as you have seen in the resolution, um, Amherst has an opportunity to, to be a moral issue, moral leader on the issue of student debt. Um, and in regards to um, the, this past weekend's New York Times editorial and, and a number of uh, big newspaper editorials have come out um, against this, uh, the, the movement of, of full student debt cancellation, which, which only points to the, I, I believe the strength and the power and the momentum that the, the movement for st full student debt cancellation is growing. Um, ultimately, the, the editorial from the New York Times is, is based on flawed data that makes bad points. Um, they cite Betsy DeVos in, in, several, um, in, in several cases. Um, they, they also, D Department of Education officials themselves have already said that trying to make uh, targeted, um, targeted forgiveness, targeted cancellation of student debt would be a bureaucratic nightmare um, worse than the initial rollout of the Affordable Care Act, um, if, if you remember that. Um, I also want to point out that, that nearly 40% of people with student debt do not have a degree. So they, they are burdened by this overwhelming uh, uh, and, and incapacitating um, financial, uh, psychological, mental, um, and, and physical burden of the debt without the benefit of any form of degree. Um, there is a sort of uh, myth that goes, goes on in, in public discourse around student debt, that this would be a, a, a giveaway to um, graduates of, of elite college, of Ivy League colleges. 99.7% of people with federal student debt did not attend an Ivy League uh, school. Um, so I, I just want to end with saying that, you know, this popular policy, which it's been proven popular in poll after poll after poll, is the single biggest thing that the president could do immediately to help working families with rising costs of living. Um, and the, the $1.7 trillion um, that is associated with, the, with this uh, debt crisis, that, that money has already, um, it's already been paid. It's already paid for the education. So, uh, so I, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, but uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, Jennifer, are there any other sponsors that have a comment at this time? Pat DeAngelis? Um, yeah, a very short comment. I want to uh, thank Courtney Cullen for speaking during public comment and sharing her story. And I want to thank uh, Councillor Devlin Gauthier for sharing parts of her story. The impacts that these two women have shared are multiplied, compounded, if you're a person of color. The difference in generational wealth is affected. And there are Brookings Institute studies that show that we need to move to looking at wealth, uh, not just current income. If you have not accumulated uh, generational wealth, which is true of many, many, many uh, families of color, then you do not, even if you get a well-paying job after college, you do not have the, the foundation that's going to allow you to move forward at the same rate that uh, white uh, student debt people can move. The system is unfair and it is discriminatory. All we're asking is for Pre President <clears throat> Biden to pay attention and to change something that we as a nation can afford to change. Thank you. Um, Jennifer. 
Uh, yes, I, um, I guess I'm supporting the sponsors. I, I, it's not the perfect solution, but it's such a terrible, multi-layered, complicated, long-standing problem. There is no perfect solution, but you have to start someplace. And it's been a very, it's been very predatory. And I think many people that are in debt, you know, particularly those who went to a for-profit college, um, there was so much our government could have done to keep those institutions from being able to market themselves and basically uh, prey on, you know, many that were, you know, vulnerable in our society. So I think this is a place to start and it's sending a message um, from, you know, Amherst is a, is not going to change federal policy, but I think it's an important message to send. And I would concur with um, Councillor Walker that I, I don't think it could do harm and it could do some good. Thank you. I'm going to ask Councillor Walker to read the last four paragraphs and then we're going to move to a vote. I want to remind the council that resolutions are not binding. Point There's of order. <clears throat> There's no motion on the table, Lynn. Thank you. Um, the motion is to adopt the resolution calling on President Joe Biden to immediately cancel all student debt loan loan debt as presented. Is there a second? Second. Any further comment at this time? Then I'd like to um, go to Alicia Walker. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Amherst Town Council calls on President Biden to take executive action to administratively cancel all student loan debt for federal student loan borrowers using existing legal authority under Section 432A of the Higher Education Act of 1965, allowing the Secretary of Education to compromise and release student debt and any authorities available under the law. Be, if, be it further resolved that the Amherst Town Council supports the Act of Guaranteed Debt-Free Higher Education, H1339 and S829 in the Massachusetts State House and State Senate. Be it further resolved that the Amherst Town Council calls on Senators Elizabeth Warren and Ed Markey, Representative Jim McGovern, Governor Charlie Baker, State Senator Joe Comerford, and State Representative Mindy Dom to demand President Joe Biden issue an executive order to cancel all student loan debt immediately. Be it further resolved that the clerk of the Amherst Town Council shall cause a copy of this resolution to be sent to President Joe Biden, Senators Elizabeth Warren and Ed Markey, Representative Jim McGovern, Governor Charlie Baker, State Senator Joe Comerford, and State Representative Mindy Dom. We'll move to a vote. Uh, and we'll start with Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is reluctantly an aye. Mandy Johanneke? No. Anika Lopes? Aye. Uh, Michelle Miller? Yes. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? Abstain. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Aye. Alicia Walker? Yes. Shalini Balmill? Yes. It's 11 in favor, one opposed, one abstention, none absent. Um, that was a big sigh, sorry. Uh, we're going to move, I want to finish the resolutions before we take a break. Uh, we're going to move to the resolution protecting adult access to plant medicine and prioritizing public health responses to controlled substance possessions. So I'm going to start in this case, first of all, with Michelle and what was the vote in GOL? Uh, the vote was to declare this clear, consistent, and actionable unanimously. 
Okay, the council sponsors are uh, Councilor Devin Gothier, Lopes, Miller, and Rooney. The community sponsors are also listed as the Multidisciplinary Psychedelic Club, University of Massachusetts, Amherst Bay Staters, Bay Staters for Natural Medicine, James Davis, Adam Fink, Adam Clem. Um, would the sponsors like to speak to the most to the proclamation? The resolution, I'm sorry. Pam Rooney. We've had some very, very interesting conversations about this proclamation. Um, it became clear as we worked through the details that there are many, um, as in many situations, there are uh, so many knowns and unknowns as far as the information that has been handed to the public over decades. Um, what I learned personally was that since the criminalization of uh, some of these substances uh, in, the 19, in 1971, that uh, in fact, there were targeted efforts to, to smear um, black communities uh, hippies communities, and that um, associating different people with different drugs was a way to do this. What has been, become clear in the testimony that we received from many, many, many of the community members who represent this proclamation, that there needs to be a new mindset. Again, this is not a be all to end all, but it is simply making a statement that we support the opportunity for the conversation to move forward and that decriminalization is an opportunity to free the anxiety and the fear of experimentation and or um, health related treatments um, by, by supporting decriminalization of this. So I would, uh, I would hope that you would give this some consideration. Michelle? Yeah, I'll add to that and say that um, definitely going through this process, I've, I've learned a lot personally. And I really just want to advocate for the voices that have come through, through public comment and um, the written emails that we've received in people that have been um, personally impacted in a positive way through these plant medicines. And it can be really difficult um, for somebody who doesn't necessarily um, struggle with anxiety or depression or post-traumatic stress syndrome to understand um, what it's like to live with those experiences. And we have people who have come to us and who have said, these plant medicines have helped us, have supported us, have helped us to release trauma, have helped us to relieve our anxiety and our depression. And so these conversations, when these, you know, th this is new to a lot of people. And um, it's something that I personally, as a sponsor of this measure, I'm asking my colleagues to just think beyond uh, perhaps where they may um where they may be used to or be comfortable with or know about and, and listen to those voices that came through. Um, I also want to say that this is not something that has um, been treated in the Amherst community with any high level of priority. Um, and that that's to me more the reason to pass this resolution, not less the reason to pass the resolution, to really send a strong moral statement um, to our um, to our, our staff and to our town leaders and to our community. So thank you. Um, Anna. So Michelle and, um, and Pam said a lot of uh, really wonderful things and I'm, I'm not gonna repeat that. The thing I just wanna talk about is the criminalization aspect of this. And um, if you look into public health, if you talk to public health experts, if you look into public health uh, research, data shows that 
enforcement of drug possession laws cause extensive and unjustifiable harm to individuals and communities across the country. And that's not evenly applied, as we know, across racial lines, across gender lines, across socioeconomic lines, that impact deepens specifically for um, for people of color and low income folks. This disrupts people's lives for possession of uh, for for personal use, not with uh, not for distribution, et cetera, et cetera. Decriminalization is one of the tools to support public health Um, for these substances in particular, uh, which are plant plant medicine that have been used by different communities and, and different populations for, as me, for medicinal use for, I mean, centuries, I'm going to go with centuries. Uh, you know, I mean, I think this is what we know we need to consider is not just our personal feelings about the use of plant medicine, but the impact on public health of decriminalization, which is a net positive for our communities. Um, I want to see if there's any other sponsors, um, Anika, did you have anything you wanted to say here? I just wanted to add, um, you know, and support everyone else who has spoken so far and our um, the public comments, but just also acknowledge that while criminalization around these substances is certainly not an issue in Amherst, that this is a an opportunity to uh, further engage in a more robust conversation around harm reduction. Okay, and I want to go to Mandy Joe because you pulled this from the agenda, from the consent agenda. Yeah. Um, the war on drugs has been abominable. I'm not, I'm not going to pretend that um, support or not support for this resolution is support for the war on drugs because it's not. Um, you know, it's, it's been used exactly how some of the sponsors have said it's been used, and that's not acceptable. But... Um, The way this resolution is written indicates that all controlled substance possession should be decriminalized. It doesn't have a limit as to how much you can possess for decriminalization. It says all um, possession of all controlled substances should be decriminalized. That includes heroin. That includes cocaine, not just plant medicines. Yet the title relates to plant medicines. And everyone's been talking about plant medicines, Um, but this resolution goes a lot farther than just plant medicines. Um, So that's one issue and concern I have about it um, is how far it goes regarding all controlled substances. And then um, as people who might read a GOL report or watch a GOL meeting, I had some real issues with the language in the now therefores regarding the policy that it maintains that that used wording such as the town council maintains it should be the policy of the word policy has been changed to practice. Um, It's a little better, um, but there's not much difference. That change allowed me to say it was actionable, but that doesn't mean I still support a practice when we haven't heard from our public health experts in town, when we haven't heard from our CRESS department in town, when we haven't heard from the fire department, our EMS department, or our police department um, regarding what some of these now therefores and what the practice um, of making it a low level priority actually means, um, especially when adults include 18 year olds who are still in our schools. Um, And so at Given how it is written, I just cannot support it. Okay. Um, I'm seeing a lot of hands, and I just want to emphasize one more time. Resolutions are not binding. They are not legislation. I fully respect everybody's efforts to bring all resolutions forward. But at no time should they ever be confused with legislation. This is not legislation. So when we use the word decriminalize, it does not mean that we are now decriminalizing it. We don't have that power. So although our police, frankly, from what I've understood, this is not a particular issue in Amherst. Um, I'm. Pam, I'm going to skip over you and go to people who haven't spoken. Uh, Andy? Pam is a sponsor. She might want to respond. Uh, I'm, okay, Pam, go ahead. Thank you. Very briefly, I wanted to give a shout out to the Amherst Police Department and the town staff 
who in fact have um, done what we are suggesting here, and that is that they have put at a very low priority um, uh, arrests for uh, possession of this material. And it is, it is for that reason that we included a phrase in there that, that acknowledged that they have in the past and, and say that they will continue to make this a very low priority. That is what we are asking for. That is the only lever, if you will, that we have. It is not legislation as, as Councilman Griesma pointed out. Thank you. Anna, did you have a response as, as a sponsor? I just wanted to, you know, I, I don't want to entertain notions that are not germane to the topic that we we're discussing, which is plant medicine specifically. However, um, I would like to make sure my fellow counselors are aware of the difference between decriminalization and legalization. Um, they're two different things. And uh, decriminalization allows for things like support and rehabilitation and other programs. So um, I don't necessarily think that is germane to plant medicine so much, but there are incredible uh, benefits to decriminalization. And I would like to remind folks that it does not mean legalization. Okay. Andy. Yeah, I uh, have a lot of the same concerns that uh, Mandy has. I cannot vote for this either. And it pains me to say that because a differently constructed resolution regarding plant medicine I could support, but not the resolution that's before us. And the reasons are several. One is that uh, Mandy made reference to the fact that there was this question about whether the resolution purports to establish policy and it's um, GOL tried to slide from that by changing the word policy to practice, but it's still, is in the end to me the same thing and we have to be very careful that we do not get into a practice of using resolutions as a way of establishing anything that even smacks of policy um, it, because we do carry weight as a council and once we've said something it puts pressure on staff and so we I think that it's something that we cannot take lightly. And I think that it has been alluded in the discussion that's been, gone on here. I think that there's the lack of clarity that has been referred to as to what exactly is um, going to be covered by some of the provisions of this resolution. Um, I find that the first whereas clause is very uncomfortable for me because it go, it almost reads as an endorsement of the use of plant-based medicine. We are, we are not in the business and should not be in the business of encouraging the use of anything. Um, and I think that that um, needs to be looked at and considered carefully is to the wording so that it makes it clear that while some people may find that, that we are not endorsing it and we should make it clear that that's um, true. Um, the, um, I think that Lynn got to the point that I had, that a lot of people have been putting this forward as, oh, Emerson is gonna be decriminalizing something. We don't have the authority to do that. And I think that she clearly stated it. And the last thing, which is gonna be a question back to the co-sponsors, there's a lot of people who I think should have been consulted, including the health director and the board of health and the crest director, uh, uh, the town attorney regarding the wording, uh, the police chief, the fire chief who runs EMS services and whether they have had any um, have any comments based upon their experience with EMS services. I have seen nothing except for some of the vague reference that has been made to the police haven't been um, prioritizing it to any of those um, people having been consulted and particularly, I really have a serious question um, about uh, Board of Health, because that is why we have the Board of Health. Have they been consulted? Shalini. 
We, can we hear the responses maybe to some of the questions that Andy asked or should I ask mine first? Michelle? Yeah, I'd like to respond. Thank you. And um, with all due respect to my colleagues here, I do feel this is being um, unequally uh, treated to other resolutions. I believe it's unfairly being targeted. Um, this is a resolution and you can't have it both ways. You know, you can't say that we've put something in there about all controlled substances and then say, um, you know, this is non-binding. So I don't, in any of the resolutions that we've done, they're a scaffolding, um, they're a moral statement, um, they're, they're non-binding, as Lynn said, so um, I do feel like this is really being unfairly targeted to suggest that this one has to have, you know, um, it's go to every department. Well, I think then we should go through all of the resolutions and we should see which departments and which staff members should have been uh, spoken with about those resolutions. Um, and I really, really urge you to think on that because um, we've passed a lot of resolutions and I am certain that they have not gone to all of the departments that Andy just mentioned um, or to all of the staff or to a legal review. Um, so if it's a resolution, it's a resolution and we treat it that way. It's not a policy. It can't happen. You can't have it both ways. Thanks. Are there any other sponsors who would like to respond at this point? Seeing none, I'm going to go on to Shalini. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I'd like to um, speak to you in support of the benefits of uh, plant medicine for health, spiritual purposes. I think we need, and I strongly believe we need more research. Uh, just the fact that it's, um, even though we are not, I understand there's a difference between decriminalization and legalization, but just making these statements and having these conversations, I think brings uh, attention to the fact that we need more research on this because there are huge, huge benefits that are possible, but because pharmaceutical companies, anyway, I'm not gonna go into that. But my point was that even though I would really like to see this pass, my one concern is that the language we use in resolutions, even though it's not actionable and all of that, is it, it's a moral statement and it sends a message out to people and young people that it's okay to um, use plant medicine. And uh, I have seen other resolutions like the one in Oakland that included, and I think a, a list of principles for safe and responsible use. And I was wondering if the sponsors had looked into including a statement and that in my mind would offset the concerns that I have. So having a statement like, whereas the following principles when adhered to help to ensure a safe and responsible use because uh, people with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or, you know, those kind of, it's not, it's, it can be really unsafe for them to use that. And I personally have used ayahuasca and it changed my life positively, but it also left me destabilized and um, for a very long time. So I just want to put it out there that, um, it is an amazing opportunity to shape, to change our mindset, to bring more research to this very valuable, important um, solution that we have in health and mental health. And we need to do this as leaders in our town in a responsible way. So I would um, want to ask the sponsors if they have considered including uh, language that would suggest that we do it responsibly and have a list of things. I'm seeing no sponsor hands at this point. Michelle? Um, I, I don't think there would be any any issue with doing that. And in fact, we've spoken with the community sponsor, Shalini, about that very thing. I think their full intention is to use this as a means to educate the community. Um, and they do, I, I in this process have learned how much work these folks are doing in the university, in the student population of educating about these plants um, and about their benefits. Um, so I, I, I think there'd be no problem with that. I do see James Davis, who is a sponsor. And I think um, given we have brought in other community sponsors tonight, um, it would only be fair to allow James to come in and speak to this. 
If you're okay with that, Lynn, I'd like to bring James in. Uh, yes. Um, James, I'm going to allow James to come in. There's another hand up and I'm not going to, we cannot do this. We have too much else to get done tonight to be debating a proclamation in a meeting. I'm sorry. James, please go ahead. Well, thank you so much, Lynn. I really appreciate all the concerns that have been brought up tonight. Uh, Bay Staters offers free classes, free forever, on the best ways to use these plants spiritually. We offer free community events in Amherst and across the state to educate people on everything from microdosing, which does not even have any bigger effects. Uh, they're all subliminal and they help people with depression, with focus, with ADHD. And I will just say that, you know, we have reached out to many different boards of public health. We received the endorsement of Tapestry that works in Amherst. And we have many different endorsements from doctors that have reached out to the town council over the past six months. We welcome those ongoing conversations since this is not a policy, this is a non-binding resolution as a means to start those conversations. Because what we've noticed is there is such stigma and bias against this issue sometimes that those conversations don't even happen, right? We reach out and then we get ignored. So that's why this type of measure helps us educate and helps us continue to do that outreach so that those conversations can be had. For example, we could meet with the Board of Public Health following the resolution so that they could have a list of guidelines that they provide to first responders. Uh, we've hosted first responder trainings because fundamentally these plant medicines are far safer than alcohol and opiates, which are what first responders are showing up to crime scenes, uh, crimes against humanity, um, seeing people like my brother blue in the face, almost dead. Uh, so we do educate. That's the entire mission of what we do. And it's free forever. And we actually even have an event this next weekend in Amherst. And so I would just welcome the opportunity to use this resolution as a means to educate and to start those conversations, because so often stigma prevents it from happening at all. Uh, we've welcomed the opportunity to meet with all of you to discuss these concerns ahead of this vote, too. And we would really welcome that conversation after because this is helping a ton of people. And the Lancet found it's the safest controlled substance out there. Um, we should refer people to services according to seven in 10 Massachusetts voters instead of criminalizing them for possession of any controlled substance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kathy? Lynn, I, I know you're trying to get off this because it's only a resolution, but when I, when, when I read a resolution that says the town council maintains that no town of Amherst department agency board commissioner officer shall use any town, state, or federal funds, it's, it's, <laughs> direct, it's directive of a particular action. Um, it's the wording, I think, that went broader than the plant medicine side. And I just looked up ethiogenic to find out a definition of what it is. It's these mushrooms, but um, poppies turn into opiates. So is a poppy a plant? So I'm, I'm just wondering what it is we're saying we should have broad access to. And then there's, so some of this is a wording issue, but um, we have a, uh, we're not endorsing distribution. And then we say, of any controlled substance on school grounds. And I was, well, we're, we're, it's okay to distribute them on other than school grounds. And I think it's just not good wording, you know, but I'm going, oh, it's okay to distribute them. So are we protecting the user? Or are we also protecting the distributor? And the wording literally says the distribution of any controlled substance. And then it goes on to school grounds. So I'm just worried that... A, a resolution is just a resolution, but it needs to be worded really carefully because these are um, endorsing certain products as uh, we think there should be broad access to them as another statement. Um, and then we're, we're doing action. So this is very, very different than resolutions declaring Martin Luther King Day um, a national holiday or commemorating different things. This 
verges right on the steps of a policy, even if we call it a practice. So for me, I wasn't in the meeting going wordsmithing this. I could wordsmith it to the point that I'd be happy saying yes, because I think the war on drugs has been truly horrible and everything we're worried about. I think uh, these, the drug industry has way oversold pharmaceuticals and under emphasize alternative medicines of all kinds. But, but that doesn't mean that we are saying, therefore, go out and use them. And you can distribute except on school grounds. I think it's just I think it's a wording issue on a few of these things that it went broader than the sponsors who have been talking to us about particular kinds of plants and particular kinds of mushrooms. This just went broader in wording. So that my husband read the Gazette thing and he said, surely you don't mean all controlled substances, but there's several places where it says all controlled substances. And I don't think it meant to do that. I don't think it meant to go really broadly. Um, so, so that's where I just, I'm really uncomfortable with this as it's currently written. Alicia. Um, thank you. I just wanted to share some of my uh, perspective on this and to just let it be known that it, like most of what I feel about the resolution is completely independent on my personal opinion on the use of psychedelic mushrooms or anything like that. Um, and those things are not linked for me because what is important here to me is like the word decriminalization and the idea and the principles behind that. And mostly because we all know that criminalization leads to stigmatization. And that is the issue here. And so I see this as a way to be really prioritizing and promoting a healthy and supportive community in the ways that I think that the whole point of this resolution was to facilitate safe consumption and use. And on the other end of that is also facilitating support for abuse. And those two things go hand in hand, but without this, the decriminalization and the absence of stigma, we can do neither successfully. Um, and so to really support our community, to support people that benefit, to support people who do not benefit because every human is different, it needs to be decriminalized. And to me, that's all things because otherwise we're not addressing it from a way of supporting and providing access and providing resources. And we're supporting it, we're coming at it in a way of like punitive control and punishment. And that we know does not support any kind of community or any type of learning, growing, or anything like that. And so that's my thinking and my, like, that's how I consumed this resolution. Dorothy? Many things have been said today, which makes sense and made me feel supportive of this resolution. However, I cannot support it as it's presently written. There are too many big loopholes as have been pointed out um, by a number of people. I also want to remind you that I was young in the 1960s and I have many personal friends who really had great damage done to them through just kind of experimenting with serious psychedelics. And in fact, I went to graduate school with a, mother, with a woman whose son, supposedly on his first use, jumped out a window and died. I know I live next door to somebody who found himself washed up on the beach in Hawaii with no idea how he ever got there. And his result then was to stop using the drugs and to go into a cult. So these are very serious things. Many good points have been made, but this resolution is not ready for us. Words matter. What we say matters. People listen to what we say. And I, I guess I had not realized that you hadn't even consulted with Town Health and with Crest. Um, you know, when you talk about decriminalization, you're talking, most of you have been talking about the user. Well, what about the seller, the dealer? Are they just going to be able to keep uh, importing all controlled substances wherever they want? I don't really think that's what you meant by this. Um, so I think that the intent of the uh, sponsors um, have somehow gotten mangled up with some loose wording, and that I think this needs to go back to the drawing board. Shalini. Yeah, I apologize for not sending my comments ahead of time. And <coughs> I, I feel that the council is very much in agreement about the core and the basic principle uh, 
would it be possible for the sponsors to incorporate these comments? I'm happy to send the Oakland thing that I have the list of things and and how do the sponsors feel about making it only about plant medicine and not leaving it open to other all um, controlled substances? What, what is the word? I don't know. Wait, wait, wait. You know what I mean? Okay. I'm going to, unless one of the sponsors speaks up that they want to take this back and work on it yet again, I'm going to put the motion on the floor. Andy? Another motion that's possible is a motion to refer, because I think that there's a lot of people who are saying something similar, which is we'd like to see some type of motion, but that this isn't the one because of all of the reasons stated. So I'm going to start with the motion that is to move to refer to the town services and outreach committee. Is there a second for that motion? Second, Shalini. Andy, would you like to speak to your motion? Yeah, I mean, I struggled as to which committee to refer it to, and because I felt that it needed work, it really does get into policy. I don't think that there's any way we could avoid this if it was... Um, any other kind of policy, we'd send it to the appropriate substantive committee. I think town services and outreach is as close as we have because it's talking about what it is that we're directing employees of the town to do and not to do. Um, and uh, I think that becomes the appropriate, the most appropriate committee that I could think of but it really needs to have some work and it needs to have some work with some counselors who are not the original sponsor group so that we can uh, broaden the people working on it and come up with a consensus that uh, I think this council could agree to. Michelle? I think it's really important that if, if that is being suggested that the community sponsors are, um, are, being consulted about that, they may not want um, they they may not want this to be referred and taken out of the hands of the sponsors. And um, I don't know how to address that, but I think that it's it's very very important that the people who brought this forward to us, who are fighting in the community for harm reduction, who are fighting in the community um, to take this stigma out. Um, need to be consulted if this is going to be referred. So um, Lynn, you are an amazing <laughs> leader, so you need to figure out how that works. But I do, I do not feel like this can be referred um, and taken out of the hands of the sponsors without the consultation of the community sponsors. I'll address that, but I'm going to call on Mandy Jo. She may have a thought. I my I'm, I am going to say this. Resolutions are resolutions that the council pass. When we have community sponsors, it's terrific. We provi they provide input. They express their opinions, and they work with us. But ultimately, the council owns the resolution. And so if the council wants to have this resolution reviewed, in another manner, that is a council decision. When they do that, they clearly should continue to consult with the community sponsors. But it, it's a resolution before the council it is something we vote on. That is my personal opinion. Mandy Jo? So I'm not sure which one I'm gonna vote on a motion to refer. Um, I am fine with voting the resolution, voting no on the resolution tonight. Um, a motion to refer requires more counselor time to be devoted to something that I haven't gotten a good idea as to whether the council wants to make it a priority um, to deal with this. Um, 
And, you know, I think a referral does recognize that such a resolution probably is policymaking or close to policymaking. And so I, I'm not sure I want the council's limited time and the community, the committee's limited time to be spent on this as a policymaking document um, or a potential policymaking document when there are so many other priorities that we want to address. And so I don't know which way I'm going to vote on a referral. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, Michelle. I just want to point out that, and I was responding to Andy saying that this should be reviewed by non-sponsors. I, I, I understand, uh, um, and I agree actually with what Mandy just stated in terms of sending this to uh, sending a resolution for referral to another committee um, is not a practice that I am aware of this council has participated in. And um, if I'm wrong, please do correct me. But um, this, this does then, to me, move this toward a policy when we're very clearly saying we support this, we're not decriminalizing, we can't decriminalize, we can't legalize. We're simply saying, and I think really Alicia wrapped it up, um, as well as any of us could um, to say that what the heart of this is about. And um, so it's my comment. Okay. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring the question to a vote. We have now spent an enormous amount of time. Point of order. You, yes. you can't just declare a vote without a motion to, to call the question, Lynn. Well, then I'll move when the to motions call the on question. the table. I'll move to call the question. Is there a second? Are we seconding um, the uh, Andy's motion or the original no. motion? The second is to whether or not I can call the question and the debates so that we move on to vote. I second. Change seconds. <laughs> okay. The motion on the table right now is to end debate. Okay. Um, and we start with Anna Devlin Gothier. Yes. Lynn Griesmer is a yes. Aunt Mandy Johanneke. Yes. Anika Lopes. Yes. Michelle Miller. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. No. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. No. Shalini Baumil. No. Pat DeAngelis. No. The motion passes nine in favor, four opposed. We now move to the motion that's on the floor, which is to refer the resolution to the Town Services and Outreach Committee. This motion's been made and seconded. Is, is there any other comment? Pat. I have a question more than a comment. It seems to me that the select board and town meeting passed the decriminalization of marijuana, uh, which is still fed federally an illegal substance. So this kind of issue has already been addressed by the town previously. Um, and as you know, we're talking about using cannabis revenue to support reparations. So I'm very confused uh, uh, by, by, being, by seeing the history of decriminalizing marijuana and a request to decriminalize plant medicine. What's the difference? What, why, why one and not the other? Is there anybody who was part of town meeting that would like to speak to that when it was passed? No, Pat, that we have an answer. Jennifer? Point, point of order. 
Yeah. If we just move to call the question and that vote passed, shouldn't we be I, voting? I, yes. Let's vote. Absolutely. Thank you, Mandy Jo. So the motion on the floor is to refer to TSO. Okay. We're going to begin with Mandy Jo Haneke. No. Jennifer Lope. I'm, I'm sorry, Anika Lopes. I'm sorry, is this to um is this to refer to TSO? Yes. Um, no. Michelle Miller. No. Dorothy Pam. No. Pam Rooney. No. Kathy Shane. I'm going to abstain. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. I'm sorry, it wouldn't unmute. No. Alicia Walker. No. Shawnee Balmil. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. No. Anna Devlin Gothier. No. Lynn Griesmer is a no. Uh, I believe it's one in favor, nine opposed, and one abstain. No. Two, two, two in, in favor. favor. Two opposed. I'm sorry. No, two, in favor. two in favor. Two, two in, in favor, favor, ten opposed, one abstention. Thank you. Um, so the motion then that we had before that has not ever been placed on the table is to adopt the resolution protecting adult access to plant medicine and prioritizing public health responses to controlled substance possessions as presented. Motion's been made and seconded. Jennifer? Is there still the option to, is it an option to send it back to TSO for rewording? Is it seem like it's- TSO or GOL? Sorry, GOL, GOL. You can make a motion. Um, well, I would like to make a motion that it be referred back to GOL for clarification in the wording. Is there a second? Shane, second. second. Okay. Okay, so this is putting the other motion aside, just to be clear, okay? Alicia. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't take my hand down, but I was actually going to ask the exact same question. So. Okay, so the other motion is put aside at this point. The motion is to refer it back to GOL for additional work on the wording. Pat? It seems to me that we're saying to GOL, and we've done this recently and I'm having trouble with it, change this substantively. That's not GOL's job. Right. This resolution was declared, declared clear, consistent, and actionable as written. So unless the sponsors themselves request it be referred to a committee and that the sponsors then work with that committee of their own free will, I don't think it belongs. Uh, it, it doesn't we're, we don't have, we shouldn't be referring it to GOL or anywhere. This is a decision of the sponsors. Felony. I think it's a technical thing. So could we just ask the sponsors to redo the, the resolution based on the feedback they heard and bring it back to GOL? We've already declared this resolution clear, consistent and actionable. 
And I think that we need to move forward with that unless one of the sponsors or the sponsors, and probably you could have checked in by your phone, even though we're not supposed to do that because we do it all the time. Um, you really need, as far as I'm concerned, sending it to GOL to make substantive changes is inappropriate unless the sponsors request it. Jennifer. I, I, I mean, I was on GOL. Um, I'm on GOL, but I, what I'm hearing is that many in the council don't think it was clear. Right. So, so it doesn't matter. I think it, well, I mean, that's, I think we You're, may. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Jennifer, go ahead. It doesn't, that's what I'm saying. I think it's not as clear as maybe we thought it was. Now, is there the option for the sponsors to bring it back to the council again? Or would they have to bring it back to GOL? They couldn't bring it directly to the council. It, it really should go back to GOL if, for a clear, consistent and actionable if there's any more changes. So that's why I made the motion for it to go back to GOL, because I don't think it's as clear as we thought it was. Unless the sponsors request it, that's an in, inappropriate referral. I don't know that I agree with that, Pat, but yeah. uh, Michelle. I am always in favor of finding a solution and having a bridge, um, but I will speak first as a sponsor and then as the chair of GOL. We have been working on this resolution for months. Um, we have looked at this wording very carefully. It is not true that this um, says uh, that what Kathy said about it referring to distribution of all controlled substances. Um, and as far as GOL is concerned, um, we brought this twice. We've now reviewed this twice in GOL. Um, Mandy's concern came up the first time about policy. We brought it back to GOL. Um, Mandy herself did a review of the words policy and practice as they related to government uh, resolutions and that you can see in the GOL report. And we declared it clear, consistent, and actionable. I think that there are counselors here who want to support this, but there is something holding them back. And I don't think it's about changing wording or making this more clear or not clear. And I am so sorry. I do not mean to disrespect my fellow colleagues here, but I, that is, that is how it feels to me um, from my seat. Shelley. Uh, I do want to say it pass, and I do have legit concerns about the language, and I think it's very easy to clarify them. Um, we did get responses back to the afternoon, which I didn't have time to look at and respond back to. So I think it's perfectly uh, legitimate for us to ask GOL to take another look and incorporate the questions and clarif clarifications that we've asked for. Otherwise, I would find it hard to send out um, to support a document, which, which I'm wholeheartedly supporting, but I would struggle to say yes to something that does not include the clarity of this being for plant medicine, or is it cocaine, or is it everything, and and what and having the language like Oakland and other towns that have passed this have included, which very specifically include the principles. And that needs to be part of the resolution because, again, the messaging is really important. Um, I'm, man, I'm gonna, Michelle. I'm just gonna ask Mandy Joe, and then I'll come back to you. Okay, Mandy Joe. I agree with Pat that this doesn't belong back in GOL for a clear, consistent, or actionable ruling. Um, what I'm hearing from counselors is some don't want to vote no, and they're trying to find a way to get this changed substantively. The, the resolution's wording is clear. We've heard from the sponsors, especially the community sponsors, that their intention is to reference all controlled stuff, substances. That's not a mistake, according to the sponsors, from what I've heard in their conversations. And so I, I think it's just a matter of the counselors deciding to vote whether to support this resolution as worded or not. Um, and that might be a hard vote. That's what we're here to do. It might not be a comfortable vote um, because of what a no might be perceived as, but it does not belong back in GOL. Michelle. Yeah, um, can we, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Lynn, but can we please ask James to speak for one minute about this piece about controlled substances to clarify this, please, just for one minute. 
um, yeah, I think he'd, he'd do better than any of us can on that. James, please enter the room. Hi, thank you, town councilors. I really appreciate all of this feedback. The resolution does three things. The first is that it decriminalizes the cultivation and exchange of entheogenic plants that include psilocybin and ayahuasca. These plants are extremely safe, far safer than the alcohol that's sold at many corner stores. The second part of the measure decriminalizes the possession of all controlled substances. We have been in conversation with the Amherst Police Department and police departments across the state to clarify that we plan to set that at a very low level at the state level. But this is not a policy. This is a proclamation, so it would not have made sense to set an amount. The third thing that it does is decriminalize the production and testing of controlled substances at UMass Amherst, at universities, by credentialed researchers. That's an important element of this because eventually we want the director of public health to be able to authorize those studies without the expensive red tape that DEA creates that prevents 21st century Alzheimer's research. Those are the three actions it takes. It does not decriminalize distribution of all controlled substances. I assure you that as someone who almost lost their brother, I would never be behind a resolution that did that. And I would also add that we're losing about 60 veterans a year to suicide, and we've lost 25 first responders in the last three years. So for us to neglect the ability to make a moral statement on whether people should be able to use a plant that we've used for 8,000 years, I think that people should take a stand on that. And we want to know where our town councilors stand on it. And a lot of people in the community want to know where people stand on that. We educate, we're open to meeting with all of these organizations about the resolution after uh, to make it more practicable uh, because that's what it is. It's a call for the town council uh, to say that they want this to eventually become practice. And then we work with those stakeholders to make the necessary changes to different town departments. Um, so thank you for your service and thank you for all of this feedback. Thank you for hearing us. Andy. So just the wording that it, it does three things and decriminalizes three named things makes me very uncomfortable because that's not what we have the authority to do. And I don't even think that necessarily that that's what the wording says, but I think that there's a real lack of clarity between us and the community sponsors about what is intended here and what is achieved here. I think that uh, this really needs um, more time, more work with the community sponsors, and uh, uh, we should take it from that. Dorothy. So when you talk about decriminalizing possession, does that mean from drug dealers or just users? Um, a simple measure that talked about making it easier for UMass to do research, I could see that. That would be a good step and I could see it. But this sounds like you're just trying to do three or four things with one measure without enough thought. I am going to use my privilege as a counselor and speak. In the various statements that we just heard with the words, it decriminalizes. This resolution does not decriminalize. It asks that it be considered. But that's how this resolution seems to be being used to suggest we have decriminalized something and we haven't. So I have no problem with plant medicine, but I have problem when statements like this are then used, quoted to us as we heard during public comment, at least two different resolutions 
during public comment tonight of this council were repeated back to us. If this is seen as decriminalizing, it isn't. I can't support that. Alicia. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to say that I think possession is quite literally the person who is possessing it. And when it's somebody who, who is selling it, then is being described as distribution and not possession. And so those are like the two different defining terms. Um, and then also, I mean, I understand this conversation is getting very long and that must be frustrating because we all have busy lives and it's really late. But I think this is really a really important process for us to be going through together as a council because it also shows that us as a council are very unclear as to our processes and like how to accomplish things that we want to accomplish. And I think this is a very telling conversation as a group as to some some things that we may need to revisit as a council, because I'm super confused right now as to what process we're supposed to take to get done the things that we want to get done. And it seems like a lot of other counselors also have different input as to how they think this should happen, as to how this can be successful and like what we should actually do. And I think that that, that is just signifying a larger issue to our governing rules and policies and what resolutions actually mean and what abilities we actually have to make. And I, I just, I think that this is a bigger issue that we need to revisit as a council as a whole. Um, and I thought that I just wanted to say that because that was the reason that I voted no to ending the conversation because I don't think we should end this conversation. We all have a lot of learning and understanding to do. And it's very clear by this conversation. Michelle? I, I do agree that we need to uh, talk more about resolutions and, and what they do and don't do. And I, I, I support that. Um, I, I want to say that this has been out there for weeks and some of what has been um, brought forward tonight could have been sent to us in advance. Um, I understand with the way that things happen, that's not always possible, but this one has been out there for quite a long time. Um, and I also want to say that I think there's a, a bit of a misunderstanding about the way that decriminalization is being used in this context. Um, we're very clear, and we've been very clear with the community sponsors, that we cannot and are not decriminalizing plant medicine. We are saying, if we vote yes to this, that we support decriminalization. And I, I, I think just the word decriminalization has some... Uh, misunderstandings around it. Um, it's not, it, 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 it is, it is not legalization. There is a process that occurs like with cannabis that occurs. Um, and so resolving here tonight is saying, we're going to have future conversations about this. We're going to talk to all of the various people. We're going to educate the community. It is not saying Amherst has decriminalized plant medicine. There's a motion on the table. It's been made and seconded. It's to refer to GOL. Yes. Athena, am I correct? Yes. I'm looking for additional hands. Okay. Um, We'll start with Anika Lopes. This is to refer back to GOL for further word clarification. No. Michelle Miller. No. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Pam, I can't, didn't hear you. I said no. Thank you. Kathy Shane. I'm going to say yes, but it sounds like they don't want it. So. Andy Steinberg. I'll also say yes and recognize the same thing. Jennifer Taub. Yes. <clears throat> Alicia Walker. No. Shalini Baumil? Yes. 
Pat DeAngelis. No. Anna Devlin Gothier. No. Lynn Grace Mersey, yes. Mandy Johanneke. No. The nose have it. One, two, one, two, three. Six in favor uh, and seven opposed. So it does not go to GOL. The motion on the table is. I don't believe that motion is on the table yet. The motion no, to not. adopt. No, I'm going to put it on the table. It's to adopt the resolution calling on. I'm sorry. It's to adopt the resolution protecting adult access to plant medicines and prioritizing public health responses to controlled substance possession as presented. Michelle? I second, but uh, do we have an opportunity to read like the other resolution um, was read the last couple um, paragraphs? Yes, we do. Okay. Do um, one of the other sponsors want to do that? Anna, Anika? You can go for it. All right, I gotta pull it up. Uh, is that okay, uh, Lynn? Please, Michelle, yes. Okay. okay, okay, hang on. I'm just trying to find it. I got a lot of stuff going on here. Um, okay, so I'll just read the, the last uh, couple. Um, now, be it further resolved that the, this resolution does not authorize or enable any of the following activity. All right, that's not a good one to read. Hold on. I mean, they're all good, but... Let me start over. Okay. Now, the, therefore, be it resolved that the Amherst Town Council hereby maintains that the use and possession of all controlled substances should be understood by town governments, agencies, boards, commissions, and all employees of the town, first and primarily as an issue of public health, harm reduction, and as a restorative racial justice initiative. I'm going to stop there. Okay. Shelley. Can we do a friendly amendment and just change all the, make it consistent with just make it entheogenic uh, instead of all controlled substances and then it's just consistent and no? I, you can do whatever you want, okay? okay. But I'm going to ask the clerk of the council or anybody else like Mandy Joe or Paul, how do I table an item for future consideration? We have had enough time on this. You move to table. I'm moving to table. Paul? A second. Yeah, I don't think you need a motion. You can just, as a counselor, table thing. You can just move it to the next agenda. No, Mandy Joe? It's a motion. But I'm on it on an agenda specific. So I'm going to move that we table that we somebody help me out here i don't normally make these motions um i'm going to move that you can, we you can move to postpone to postpone, a date, thank a specific you. date i'm going to move to postpone this to june June 20th. There's okay. not a meeting on June 20th. That's, That's a holiday. holiday. I'm sorry. June. We have 6, 13, and 27 in 13. June. I started the 13th. I'm going to go to the 13th. June 30th. I mean, June 13th. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Further questions? I yeah, I, I'm unclear if this is a vote or if this is like the um, authority that you're using. This is no, this is not the nuclear option and it's not my authority. It's a motion from a counselor. Okay, thank you. Thanks for clarifying. Yes, I thank you for asking so that I would clarify. I totally agree. Michelle, I mean, Alicia. And my question was also just clarifying. So moving it to the 13th just means like we rehave a discussion and a vote then or? Yes. Okay. Okay. And I 
want to just ask all counselors who want to do any motions to change any wording, look at this far in advance and make sure that you provide any of those changes to me and to the clerk of the council as required. We're going to take a five minute break. Okay, I'm sorry if I sound a little short on this, but, um, and then I'm going to tell you how we're adjusting the agenda for the rest of the meeting. We'll see I'm, you. Wait, Lynn, yes. don't we have to vote on this? I thought you just said this was a vote and not the nuclear. I'm sorry. Yeah, there hasn't no. been a, a vote. And I just wanted to point right. out that on June 13, the motion on the table would be to adopt it as presented. Yes. As it is right now. As it is right now. Stupid. Okay, so the motion on the floor is to postpone to the 13th and to adopt it as it is now. Is there any further question about the motion? Shalini. But what I'm hearing is that we can offer other motions, which we can send in advance to you and Athena. Once the motion, the motion will already be on the table, you can offer a minute. Right. right. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Then we're going to start with Michelle Miller. No. I'm sorry, Michelle, I didn't hear you. No. Thank you. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. I'm sorry, I thought we were starting our five minute break and I missed what we were voting on. <laughs> voting on the post, I'm very sorry about all this confusion. Um, we're voting on the motion to postpone till June 13. Sure, sure. Did you, yeah, that's a yes. That's a Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. No. Shalini Bowman. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. No. Anna Devlin Gothier. No. Lynn Griesmer is a yes. Mandy Johanneke. No. Anika Lopes. No. Seven in favor, six opposed. Okay. Uh, we are going to take a five minute break. I will see you all back here at 925.
Fine. Jesus. When you return, please turn your video back on so I know you're here. When you return, please turn your video back on so I know you're here.
So with regard to the agenda, oh, well, I'll wait for Alicia. When you return, Alicia, please turn your video back on so I know you're here. Okay, we're just going to get going. Um, we, do, we will have to deal with item 8B tonight because of the state deadline. Um, the recommendation for the motion for can for the earmarking of cannabis funds for reparations. I know there's a, a presentation, Michelle. I don't want to short shorten that. Uh, and so I'm going to ask you, would you prefer that it be on a future agenda item? It's also a referral to finance. Um. While I understand that AB needs to happen, and I, I support that, um, the members of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly have been here since 6.30. We were told our presentation would be at seven. Um, and I, get, I understand that that isn't always the case, but it's now 9.30. And so um, I think we have a lot of momentum with the um, public comments that we received. and. I would like us to have the time to make our presentation tonight. Um, okay. Uh, then I'm going to propose. I'm going to postpone the uh, permanent and interim parking regulations on North Pleasant Street to another night. And when we do that, it will not be on the consent agenda because it's already been removed. Mandy Jo, correct? Well, I removed it. So if you put it on consent agenda again, I will remove it again. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right. Um, we have Jen Brown, who is going to talk about, about the opt out of state sponsored mosquito spraying through Massachusetts State Recla Reclamation Mosquito Control Board. And she is joined by Christopher Craig from the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control. Right. Point of order. Yes. Yes. You just muted yourself, Pam. You skipped over 7B, 7A and 7B. I did not hear any discussion about moving those to another time. Oh, I'm sorry. Those were already scheduled to happen after 8, A through E. And I put on your I put on your agenda that if these items need to be delayed and they will be I'll find another time and on sometime in June to put them on. I'm sorry, Pam. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, so in other words, items 8D and 7A and 7B will be postponed to a future agenda item. Okay. Um, so Jen Brown, who is our Director of Health, please proceed. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Jennifer Brown. I am the Amherst Health Director, and I'm joined by Christopher Craig, who works for the Department of Public Health and oversees the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District. So here today to talk about two mosquito control issues, two distinct, distinct discussions and votes. There's a little bit of overlap. But I'd like to start with the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District and whether to join or not. We're going to start, though, with three um, slides. Athena, thank you very much. If you can go to the next slide. One of the reasons that we're here tonight um, is because the De Department of Public Health has earmarked us as a high regional risk area. So the 2022 historical 
um, regional risk level is we're red. And you can see on the map, it's a fuzzy um, map. If you go to the website, it's still fuzzy. There's actually a link to a table if you want to see the, the towns that are red, high risk, low risk, risk or medium. You can see that Amherst is red to the east of us. We have Ware, Pelham, Belchertown, um, Granby. They're also high risk. To the west of us, Hadley, Hatfield, Northampton, they are low risk and green, and they're going to have different um, qualifications to opt out or not, but we'll get back to that soon. So I just wanted people to see this. The reason that we are in the red designation is in part due to our mosquito habitat. So Amherst has these um, uh, hardwood, red maple, cedar, freshwater swamps that are the perfect breeding ground for Tripoli mosquitoes. So if you park at Station Road and you head down Belchertown uh, bike path, you'll see these mosquito crypts. That's where we see um, the um, triple E mosquitoes. The other reason that we're in the red is that we've um, been flanked by towns that have had positive triple E mosquito pools, um, positive animals. There was a horse, I believe, in 2019 on the Amherst Belchertown um, border that um, died through triple E. We can go to the next slide. <clears throat> Then I wanted to say just a few things about Tripoli and why that we're here. And obviously, Tripoli um, is a very serious disease. Um, it is has a high mortality, 30 to 50 percent. Um, first neurological signs are a high fever, 103 to 106. Um, people that survive this have neurological damage. Um, I put the two mosquitoes there that cause Tripoli. E, and again, they come from these swamps. I just want to say briefly that the mosquito that causes West Nile virus is a different mosquito and their habitat is more this brackish water that we know that when people say, hey, please turn over your bird baths or recycle, you know, your, your, your standing water, there's different mosquitoes. Um, and then the last slide, Athena. So this is moving into why we should join the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District. So um, Chris will have some thoughts on this. So I'm gonna, just gonna go through um, quickly. Reasons to join are surveillance. Um, they're able to set the traps. They're able to type the mosquitoes. They can look at viral load. They can do mapping for us. Um, I think they'd be able to communicate these, these um, outcomes very rapidly as well. Um, they provide education. They'll be able to supplement what we do, but also they'll have their own education in different languages. They can join um, health fairs, whatever we need to support us to get the word out about um, Tripoli and education. They also do public outreach. And I think what I mean by that is when we get um, samples that are positive, they're going to be able to communicate with us very quickly about what's going on in town um, and let us know. Um, what their Tripoli um, threat is, what the risk is, what actions we need. Um, the fourth thing is communication. This is something that I really um, appreciate is Chris Craig is here today. He's great answering his phone. He's a great communicator. He speaks with the Department of Public Health, with the Mosquito Reclamation Board, um, so I think that's really great to have that back and forth. I also believe they do education um, <clears throat> together. Excuse me. One thing that the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District does not do for the 2022 season is larvicide and adulticide. So adult is getting, is spraying, it's the flying adult mosquitoes, larvicide is going into the water um, <clears throat> and putting pellets there and getting the, the, the younger mosquitoes. So that's something we hope that they'll, they'll do soon, but they don't do at this point. So I'm gonna stop with that part of the presentation. Um, Chris, do you wanna clarify or add anything? Does anyone have any questions? <coughs> sure, so yeah, Jennifer, you, she summarized it perfectly. You know, we're, uh, we're a new district in the state of Massachusetts. We've been growing over the past couple of years um, because the Pioneer Valley was the only region of the state that didn't have a mosquito district. So we, we now service 20 members and 
like she mentioned, we, we operate a surveillance program to monitor for these mosquitoes that might be carrying triple E or West Nile virus. Um, going into the future, as we grow, we're going to offer, you know, the actual control services, but you know, those, those services are going to be optional because the way our district operates is towns kind of pick and choose which services they want to subscribe to and they pay accordingly. So the only real mandatory service is, you know, the surveillance program, because that's kind of the backbone of our, of our program. Um, so yeah, you know, um, we're happy to help and, uh, you know, provide any educational or resources, you know, involving mosquitoes. And I'm happy to answer any questions as they come up. Then I can't hear you. Could you go back and show us the map and slightly enlarge it? Again, I apologize. That's as clear as I could get on the, the website. It's not very clear. But like I said, there's a, a table and that you can read our neighbors and who's, who's uh, high, who's low. Okay. All right, thank you. And I think we can take the slides down. We have questions. Uh, Mandy John. My question is for um, Paul, probably. Um, last year on May 17th, 2021, the council voted to join the Pioneer Mosquito Valley Mosquito Control District. And then we also voted to use it to opt out. Um, you know, it's management plan to opt out, but we voted to join the district. Do we have to do this vote every year? Is that why no. we were presented with it again? Um, or if, if we don't, could, could Paul explain why we're asked to vote again to join the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District? Paul? Yeah, so um, well, with intermunicipal agreements, you need to do it every year. But once we join with this one, it goes on the, uh, we just need to do it once. And I think there was some, um, the way we did it last year wasn't exactly the way the state wanted us to do it. So we're doing it in the correct way this year. And that's why Chris has been here to help us with this. Thanks. Right. If, Thank you. If I could just add something to that. The reason it was not uh, approved by the state reclamation board was because specifically the language used to join the district to opt out wasn't sufficient because joining the district isn't an automatic opt out. So that, you know, that's a decision that's made by the uh, executive office of energy and environmental affairs. So we kind of uh, crossed the wires in a way there. Are there any other questions at the moment? I do want to add. Oh, go ahead. Jen. I want to add that on May 5th, the Board of Health um, voted, voted to join the Pioneer Valley District. Okay. Dorothy. Um, I just need some clarification. So <clears throat> joining this group, there is surveillance. Um, it, but is there, is there spraying or is this, what, what is, what is done and what is not done in terms of dealing with mosquitoes, mosquito larvae? So currently the, the way we operate is we manage our surveillance program and each town gets the same service. So each week through the summer from June through October, um, two traps a week are deployed in your town and they get sent to the Department of Public Health for testing for both West Nile virus and Triple E. Mm -hmm. So that's our kind of sole service right now, in a, you know, in addition to being, you know, an educational resource. Our, uh, our biggest thing is we've been, <laughs> we've been getting demand and growing faster than we can uh, kind of meet it. So our current project right now is we're getting, working to get into a facility where we can, you know, face our operations out of to start offering those additional control services like spraying and larval control. So we're currently in the process of acquiring a facility because, you know, it's super important to have a facility that's sufficient to uh, properly store those pesticides. So that's why we're not offering those yet because we don't have that facility where that is, um, you know, safe and a, a good thing to do. But we're currently in the process of acquiring it. So, you know, we're excited to hopefully in 2023 be able to go beyond surveillance and actually offer those means of control to our communities. Do you have sprays that don't um, kill honeybees? Now, there is a host of sprays, you know, they're all 
approved by, of course, the EPA and as well as the Massachusetts Pesticide Board. We, the, the, tent, the practice in mosquito control is to spray in the evenings at night to avoid contact with honeybees in their hives. But, you know, as we grow, we're going to, you know, develop an exclusion system like our other mosquito districts in the state where, you know, people that have honeybees can inform us where they are and if they have them, as well as, you know, make uh, requests to avoid their property, you know, from spraying. That being said, you know, spray events are going to be at the discretion of the towns, you know, so no one's going to be required to engage in the, with the Pioneer Valley Mosquito District to spray if they don't want to. So it's more of a uh, kind of a decision between the district and the town rather than, you know, going to private property upon request. Thank you. Pam? Yeah, my question is actually to probably Lynn. Um, a, B says, has both actions, um, and if you could kindly clarify, are we going to vote on one thing and then another motion to vote on another? It looks like it's combined here. Please clarify. The motion is that the town of Amherst join the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District as recommended by the public health director and the Board of Health. That's the only motion I have. Athena? The, the other part, the opt out, the Board of Health did not recommend that the town opt out. So there's no motion needed because we're, the recommendation is to not opt out of the state sponsored mosquito spraying. Thank you. Pam? Okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, and I think it actually will go to Chris. Last year, even though this was became somewhat um, confused as representative of the fact that Mandy Jo said, didn't we vote on something like this last year? Um, there was something about you having a plan that the state would approve, but then ultimately because the state's regulations, which have been cleaned up somewhat, um, they wouldn't accept your plan. So what do you anticipate this year with regard to that? Now, do you mean plans specifically regarding Amherst or the district itself? Because I'm not quite this, sure. The district itself. Um, as far as I'm aware, you know, we work closely with the SRB. We don't have any plans that have been in conflict with uh, the SRB. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, it might be my misunderstanding of what happened because it became a very confused situation. At this point, right. what you're saying is you do have a state approved plan. We do. Yeah, we follow, you know, all guidance from the SRB. They are our legal and our administrative council. Um, you know, in Amherst as alone, we've had multiple members that have had, there's been some mistakes with misunderstanding between making votes when you know, they can be kind of strict on the language when votes go to a city council or an annual town meeting. So <laughs> it, it's happened in the past, but, you know, we don't we don't operate outside of their purview by any means. OK, so I'm going to put the motion on the floor. The motion is that the town of Amherst join the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District as recommended by the public health director and board of health. Is there a second? Second, Shalini. Are there any other questions or comments? We need a public comment on this item. That's right. Thank you. Uh, I'm, the floor is now open on public for public comment on this item only. If you have any public comment, please raise your hand. I don't see any public comment. Um, and I want to just note that we did have other general public comment earlier tonight, and there was no public comment with regard to this at that time. So I'm back to um, the council. Are there any other questions from the council? Then we're going to move to a vote. Um, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. 
Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Belmill. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devon Gothier. Aye. Lynn Greesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Yes. It's unanimous. Okay. May I just add one thing? Yep. Um, The SRB is going to want to see in the minutes that the council has voted to approve funding the district's membership, which is, you know, same, it's the same price for every member. It's 5,000 for fiscal year. And I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, they'll see the minutes and be able to put Amherst forward in the June SRB meeting. So they just look for the, the, the language is perfect for, you know, voting to join the district, but they also need to see the funding component. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, Mr. Bachman. Yeah. So in order for us to put the, do an appropriation from the council, it requires a public forum and a number of other steps. So we can't do that tonight. Mm-hmm. And I, my understanding is that the funding is put on the cherry sheet uh, and that's how it gets funded. No, we're a voluntary contribution district where it, the talents pay us directly. So we're a little different in that regard. We're not like the other districts. So, Paul, I think what we need to do then is uh, we need to post. We'll work on the details on how we can do this, Lynn. Great. Um, I apologize need- for this. It would need to be referred to finance committee if we could do that. Okay. Uh, and uh, that if we need to hold a hearing or a public forum, finance committee could do so. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to make a motion to ref- Athena, do you want to word a motion for me, please? To refer a $5,000 appropriation for the mo- for the mosquito spraying through the Massachusetts State Reclamation Mosquito Control Board to the Finance Committee for review and recommendation to the Town Council by June 13. Second, Devlin Gothier. I'm not making that motion. I thought Lynn was. I thought Lynn was I making. Made, I made the motion. <laughs> Evelyn Dot uh, Sorry, yeah. I thought Lynn was. Uh, is that great. sufficient timing? is what I want to know. Or do we need to move it up? I'm not hearing anything from Paul or Chris. No, I think that's, that should be fine. Okay, Mindy Jo, you have a question. Yeah, my question is if this has already been included in the proposed budget from the town manager, and if so, do we even need a special appropriation or can it just be a clarification on an appropriation order that we're going to be voting for FY23? Good question. Paul, I don't think it's in the budget, is it? No, I, no, I think what I would need to come back to you with a, a memo that would explain, we are, our intention is to pay it out of the FY22 budget okay. because we have funds in the health department budget right now to pay this. So that's why I'm a little confused about the appropriation requirement. Okay. We'll work it out. But Mandy Joe, thank you. Um, okay. Uh, so the, there's a motion and it's been seconded. Mandy Joe. Sorry, if a question, if it's already, if we have all, if we already have funds in the budget that don't need reappropriated, it's not a new appropriation, is it? So, you know, it might just. That's there might not need to be any charter five, six, or I think it's five, six items at all. Right. Yeah, I think what Athena is saying, like let's vote it tonight in case we do need to do it. And if it's not necessary, we won't do it. Okay, so we're voting to refer to the finance committee. uh, And if they don't need to come back with a motion for the appropriation, then we'll figure that out, okay? Um, so the motion before you is to refer to the, this to the finance committee. Athena, would you read the motion, please? To refer a $5,000 appropriation to the finance committee for state sponsored mosquito spraying through the Massachusetts state reclamation mosquito control board for review and recommendation by June 13. 
Motion's been made and seconded, or are there any further questions? Excuse me, Lynn, can I ask, Chris, was that proper wording? Were we talking about the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District? Because that said state yeah. reclamation. I, I would use the wording Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District. Thank you, I'll change that. Thanks. Okay, so now would you read the motion again? To refer a $5,000 appropriation to the Finance Committee for joining the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District to the, um, I'm sorry, for a review and recommendation by June 13. Okay, I'm, I was the original motion maker, so I accept that change. And uh, Anna, I think you- I also do. Okay. Dorothy, you have a question. No, I, before I go to you, Chris, is that an acceptable motion? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, yes, the motion she read before said mosquito spraying, and I thought we were joining the, the municipal it's surveillance, mos municipal mosquito surveillance district. So the new words are not quite that, but they don't say spraying, right? Or oh, whatever. Athena. The new words are to refer a $5,000 appropriation to the Finance Committee for joining the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District for review and recommendation by June 13. Okay. That motion has been made, seconded, even the edits have been agreed to. So we will go on to a, a roll call vote in this case. Um, Let's start with um, Pam Rooney. Hi. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shelney Bowman. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Hi. Anna Devlin Gothier. Hi. Glenn Grease I. Mandy Johanneke. Hi. Anika Lopes. Hi. Michelle Miller? Yes. Dorothy Pam? Yes. It's unanimous. Okay, thank you. And uh, Dorothy, you have your hand up? Uh, Jen and Chris, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to go on to the next item, which is Earmarking cannabis funds for reparations. And Michelle, I'm going to have you introduce your guest, Jerome Crawford, and proceed. Excuse me, Lynn. Um, yes. Can I go back to um, my understanding is that we were going to discuss opting out of spraying by the State Reclamation Board. So there were two parts to my presentation that was joining the Pioneer Valley and then opting out. Okay. I'm sorry, I was only going by the motions. Um, all right, are there any comments with regard to opting out? If we don't, if we this is my understanding. We have to vote to opt out. If we vote, if we don't vote to opt out, then we are automatically in. Is that correct, Jen? Yes, that's my understanding. Michelle? I thought that it was um, just mentioned that since the Board of Health made the recommendation um, not to opt out, that we weren't going to discuss it or vote on it. So I, I'm a little bit confused about what's going on here. The, the Board of Health has made a recommendation. We can decide whether we, as a council, because we're the deciding body in this case, whether we want to accept their recommendation. Their recommendation is to not opt out, okay? So that we have the option, if needed, of spray. Right, but just a few minutes ago, we were told that we weren't gonna have that discussion because the Board of Health had voted not to opt out. So I, I'm just confused now why we're being told something different. I, I didn't, I, I understand your confusion, okay? And obviously I was confused because I was, uh, I just assumed that we were going with a Board of Health recommendation, which is to not opt out. But if there is any counselor who would like to question that decision, now is the time to do it, 
Okay. Then if I can clarify, the board Please. of health was deadlocked two to two. One person was absent, but it's, it's my, I propose that we not opt out. Okay. Thank you. Are there counselor questions about the decision or about opting out or not opting out? Dorothy. Well, if we have a surveillance system and we don't see the, the um, triple E mosquito, then we could say that we don't need to spray. That's right. That's the purpose of surveillance. So wouldn't a system make sense if you have surveillance and then if you decide you need to spray, then you say, yes, I will spray, as opposed to having to say at the beginning, I'm not going to opt out, which means I'm going to have to spray whenever somebody else says I have to spray because I don't, I'm not in control of this anymore because I did not opt out. Or if it doesn't work that way, I'd love to know how it works. Jen. So my understanding is when it becomes a public health hazard due to triple E, the state is going to come in and under you know, a phased in response through algorithms, through over days, start discussing about what we need to do. Um, so um, that is something that because we're designated as that high risk, um, we don't have the option to opt out with the state spraying unless we're able to provide that work ourselves. Um, so that would typically be through the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District, or if we were to do it ourselves, which would be a, a cost and we don't have the expertise. Okay. Pam, you need to unmute. Yeah, I think, I think that just answered my question. Uh, the, the, so the, but to phrase it a different way, um, if we, if we, opt out right now, um, do we have a choice of coming back in uh, at, at an emergency? Jen? Um, we'd have to be able to show people that we're able to spray. So it, it wouldn't be a scramble. We'd have to have a plan ahead of time. In other words, to opt out, we have to have a plan that they would approve ahead of time. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And we do not have that plan. We don't this year. No. Okay. Michelle. Uh, just so I make sure I understand. So we just um, voted to be part of what sounds like an organization that would handle whatever is required mm -hmm. for us to be opting out of this, what can be harmful chemicals being sprayed without our control. Um, and, but, but the recommendation is still to continue to spray, um, even though we have that resource that we just made ourselves a part of. I'm just trying to understand that a little bit better, Jen. Well, maybe, Chris, yeah, Chris can answer, but but joining the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District, they're not, they don't have the ability to spray this, this year. Next year, they'll have that option, hopefully. Right, that's exactly it. Because we're a new district, we haven't built up the capacity to do that yet. You know, we're, like I alluded to earlier, the Pioneer Valley didn't have access to any district at all until the last couple of years. Um, so yeah, we're kind of in this between time where, you know, as we grow, we, we still can't offer those control services but like I mentioned being a part of a district and that goes you know for every town in Massachusetts if your town is in a district that doesn't automatically mean uh, the state is going to approve an opt-out because based on the risk level they're going to be you know more strict with high-risk communities on what's considered acceptable so you yeah. know in the future when we're able to offer truck-based spraying they still might even say hey that's not enough in the case of a triple e outbreak you know that's the decision that EEA ponders in the case of a triple E outbreak. And I should make the I should make a point that, you know, these aerial, these hypothetical aerial sprays are not a regular occurrence. They only occur if there's an emergency triple E outbreak. 
And as far as I'm aware, I do not believe Amherst has been aerial sprayed in the past 20 years. I know part of Hampshire County was sprayed in 2019, but I do not believe it was in Amherst. But you'll correct me if I'm mistaken, because I, I wasn't in this position in 2019. But um, <clears throat> so, yeah, that's kind of we're that's kind of the explanation for that. We're just in that in between phase where we can't be part of your application in that way. Mandy Joe. Yeah, so last year we tried to opt out using the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control Dis Districts and our membership in that and their plan and the state denied our opt out. Um, so that they, they declared that in our town, um, being part of that control district and using their plans was not sufficient given our risk. Um, my understanding is if we choose to opt out, we have to pay the money for the spraying. But if we don't opt out, if the state declares that public health emergency and they determine that they need to spray, they pay for the spraying. Um, so it's also, you know, given the low incidence of spraying in this area and their limited use of it, and only in emergencies from what we've been able to see in the history, it is fiscally beneficial at this time probably for us to not opt out. Nicely stated. Any further questions? Lynn, I'd like to make one more comment, if that's possible. Please, Jen. So I really think it's important that we're talking about this. I also want people to know, individuals, that there's a request for exclusion from pesticide application. So there's a resident opt-out. So I think that's really important to understand because I know we're concerned about public health. We're concerned about the environment. Um, we can really push this information out. It's on the government, the state website. I've also put a link to it on the town of Amherst um, health department webpage. So that's up there now if residents want to fill out the very easy form. Okay. Anna. A, a clarifier on that, Jen, that, um, that would be filled out by homeowners, but folks who live in apartments would need their landlord to do it. Is that correct? You know, on a, um, it's a good question. I read some kind of language that they address that on the, the page, and I don't have an answer for you, but I know it is worded for property owners um, or tenants. So, Property owners or tenants. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But they do um, address and, that. Yeah. Oh, and then that's for residential. What about agricultural or um, businesses? Are, are there other opt-out programs for those individuals? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if Chris knows. I do know in the case of aerial spraying that there is the ability for farms, especially organic farms, to opt out of any of that. They already, I know they try to avoid it um, to begin with, but yeah, there is a system for that when an aerial spray occurs. On top of they, when an aerial spray happens, they do not spray over bodies of water used for drinking. What, sorry, last one. Um, what about wetlands? Wetlands, yeah, they will be spread in an aerial spray. Pam? Yeah, um, so I, I, if, if this is aerial spray, I have to just be really um, skeptical that, that you could actually miss a particular home or apartment complex. It just isn't that exact. So I really don't understand how opting out of aerial spraying may make somebody feel good, but I don't think it's very realistic. Unless we can, unless we can ask that spraying within Amherst is done from the ground. I a, yeah, I don't have an answer, but I know there's truck mounted spraying and there's fixed wing and then there's helicopter spraying. So I don't know if if you know this may come have come up again, if they need to be more precise, they might use a helicopter. But I, I don't have an answer for that. Yeah. In, in the past, they've used fixed wing aerial spraying. And I, I should note, I'm not an expert by any means. I mean, aerial spraying ha happens at a higher level above you know the local districts. So, but yeah, that, that's definitely a concern with uh, aerial spraying is the potential for drift into areas that do not want to be or should not be sprayed. 
which is why they only do it when weather conditions are just right and they do it from a very low, low altitude. Um, but right, that's a totally legitimate and valid concern. So I hear you there. Are there any other questions or comments? Then since uh, we are not opting out, we do not require a motion. And so we are ready to move on, correct, Jen? Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. And thanks, Chris and Jen. Now, I'm sorry, Michelle, it's your turn. <laughs> okay, well, I'd like to bring in um, the members of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly that are here. So we have um, Alexis Reed, Hala Heather Lord, and uh, Dr. Shabazz um, here with us. If we could bring them in, that would be great. And while they're coming in, um, I will say that we were expecting a presenter to join us. Um, Lynn did mention that, Jerome Crawford. Um, he was going to offer expert testimony on why designating cannabis tax revenue is the just and equitable way to spend this uh, or to allocate this money. Um, Jerome is the Director of Legal Operations and Social Equity at Pleasant Trees, which is a Michigan-based cannabis company that recently opened a retail location here in Amherst, and he is not able to join us now, um, but I am hoping that he'll follow up um, with an email to the council because he is very much in support and, and wanted to speak to this. Um, so I think I have to call the meeting to order um, because there's, okay. And you posted it, correct? We did post it, yes. yes. I, I knew we had that conversation. Thank yeah. you. So um, we are gonna call the meeting of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly, uh, what's today's date, May 16th um, at 10.08 p.m. Um, and I'll just quickly make sure that um, we can hear members and they can hear us, starting with you, Hala. I can hear you. Uh, Alexis. Hello. Hello. Uh, and Dr. Shabazz. Yes, hello. I'm, I'm, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, I would also just like to mention that Yvonne Mendez and Dr. Irv Rhodes are unable to join us tonight, but they are with us strongly in spirit. Um, and I'll also say that we do not have a slide deck. Um, so uh, we agreed as a committee that we wanted to speak with you rather than to scroll through slides. So I am going to start with some opening comments and then I'm going to be passing it on to my colleagues and I will go ahead and get started. Um, so we are here tonight to ask you as the legislative leaders in our community to designate cannabis tax revenue for reparations. We hope that you've had the chance to review the memo in your packet, which provides a timeline of our request dating back to November 2021, before the budget guidelines were developed, and expands on why designated designating cannabis tax revenue for reparations is the most just and equitable use of these funds. We encourage the public watching to read the memo and reach out to us with any questions or comments. You've also heard from a broad section of the Amherst public tonight, and you've re received many written public statements from people who strongly support this request. You heard from Shalene Title, a former appointee by the Massachusetts governor, attorney general, and treasurer, who served as one of five inaugural commissioners of the Cannabis Control Commission from 2017 to 2020, who strongly supports our request. You heard from former select board member and town councilor, Alyssa Brewer, who shared that the five member at large elected select board always intended to have, and this is quoting, our 3% municipal cannabis excise tax be used to address the social justice values Amherst residents held when voters supported Massachusetts legalized regulated adult use of cannabis by a wide margin. You heard from members of several faith communities and many other dedicated community members. And we encourage the members in the audience to stop by the town council page and read all of the statements that have been submitted uh, once they're available tomorrow. 
I've been thinking a lot about this presentation and I am reading from a statement tonight, um, but I, I will say I've been thinking a lot about this presentation and I had an idea of what I was going to share for opening remarks. And then I opened my news app on Saturday afternoon and saw the story about the racially motivated terrorist attack in Buffalo. I, maybe like some of you, felt many emotions, confusion, fear, anger, outrage, deep sadness, and some other emotions that are hard to put into words. And as I always do in situations like these, I called my friend and co-founder of Reparations for Amherst, Matthew Andrews, who you heard from earlier. And I'll share with you um, what he said to me, and I'm going to quote him. Uh, Dr. Shabazz, I think you, is that you? Can you mute? <laughs> Dr. Shabazz? Yes, thank you. I'll um, be very brief in the remarks. No, uh, hang on, Dr. Shabazz, could you mute? I didn't finish the opening remarks, but we could hear what was happening in the background there. So would you just mute for a moment? And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, move it to you guys, okay? All right. <laughs> um, so what Matthew said is uh, the purpose of terrorism is to use fear to accomplish a social or political goal. And that's what this was. It's a lynching. It's not a state sanctioned lynching, but this was a terrorist act with the intention of using fear to accomplish a political goal. And he said, what you've done throughout all of this is you have stood with the people that are being terrorized, the people that have been terrorized, people that are trying to stand up for their own personal dignity in the face of ongoing and persistent terrorism. The terrorism that happened during slavery, during the time of lynchings, during mass incarceration, and during big events like these, it's the same terrorism. And there's the people, Black Americans, who don't get a break. They're always being terrorized in small ways and big ways. And that really hit me. Um, and so I am asking you, my colleagues, to stand with me, but more importantly, to stand with and take a stand for residents of African heritage in this community and use your power as legislators and leaders of the Amherst community, legislators who have committed to engaging in a path of remedy for residents of African heritage to establish a clear and consistent revenue stream for true and lasting healing to happen in Amherst. Broadcast to the world that you are not going to let another day go by without doing that. I'm gonna turn it over now to my colleagues on the AHRA to share some thoughts. And I'm gonna start with uh, Dr. Shabazz and then Hala and then Alexis. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the materials we've looked at on the AHRA uh, concerning the Cannabis Control Commission uh, has included Amherst, as a city in which um, there is a record of disparity um, in the um, uh, back in the days when um, cannabis was uh, marijuana was illegal, and um, therefore reflecting a uh, a clear need for um, <clears throat> looking at uh, this issue in terms of a, from a reparative justice uh, standpoint. One of the uh, reasons in some of the studies it was not is that it was listed as uh, a high student population. I think uh, Williamstown was also, um, and, and perhaps Wellesley were also uh, in, in some studies uh, left out because of a high student population. I recall, uh, a month or so ago in a meeting when we were looking at 2020 census uh, data, uh, some of you spoke very strongly uh, to the idea that, you know, students are part of Amherst. 
Uh, they're part of our community. So I think even where uh, the certain studies may uh, leave out, want to leave out Amherst because of a high student population, I don't think that's a basis for us to not look at uh, ourselves and look at the pattern of uh, <clears throat> of arrest and the pattern of even prosecution from our district attorney's office. Um, I serve on the citizen advisory board for uh, uh, district attorney, our district attorney Sullivan. I think he's made, uh, been making a number of uh, changes and improvements, but um, from the time I got here in 2007, um, it came out in open court that the uh, uh, the county had the district had a pattern of uh, over prosecution uh, of of African Americans, both for a variety of offenses, not not only uh, uh, marijuana possession. So um, for these and and for many reasons, uh, as we've looked at it in the AHRA, um, <clears throat> it would be a a most appropriate. A step to take in terms of reparative justice to build out the fund that uh, uh, will back the plan that that you will come before you all for 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 your your for you to own uh, or not owned um, that but to have the fund ready based upon this particular revenue stream uh, as well as others as you've already demonstrated with the uh, with last year's certified free cash being put into a stabilization fund earmarked for reparations so uh, <clears throat> I just would say these are some of the reasons I took the occasion of uh, last week to go by pleasantries myself. I met the general manager there, Zach Wilson. Um, we had a, a, a good long conversation. So it's not only uh, the gentleman that um, in the out of Michigan uh, that uh, <clears throat> is, is very much uh, uh, invested in the idea of the town being a partner with uh, uh, the industry with uh, or, or with them as part of the industry to recognize the past injustices and want to, uh, uh, as they are doing with some of their own, with some of the profits that they are making. So quite apart from what they are paying, what, what's being collected in taxes, but from their own profits, they're making efforts uh, uh, as part of the industry to address uh, past uh, the past injustices in some of their business practices. And they do encourage and, and I think look forward to, uh, to being a part of this town where uh, the, the revenues are going toward uh, reparative justice measures. Um, I'll leave it at that and thank you for your time. Thanks, Dr. Shabazz. Um, Hala. Thank you. The horror and terror that was forced on the black community of our neighboring state has been mentioned, but I cannot speak publicly without saying that my heart bleeds with the African Americans that feel this threat in their bones and spirit today, with the residents of Buffalo and with the victims' loved ones. May all of our thoughts and prayers be transformed into actions and change. Although we have not had a mass shooting in Amherst, black bodies have been under assault since before the incorporation of this town in 1759. Amherst cannot grow into its fullest greatness without first acknowledging racialized harm perpetuated on the black residents, past, presence, and I truly fear the future, without education, advocacy, and an investigation into, with the commitment to reducing harm from, the policies and actions of the town that disproportionately and discriminatingly targets us, and without major, meaningful movement towards reparative justice. Black residents in Amherst are dying from the harm because racism is most certainly a public health crisis as, and is reflected in the hypertension, the cardiovascular disease, and many other disproportionate illnesses. And today I lift up suicide as well, remembering two and a half years ago, seeing it at a black man's funeral here in Amherst who was in his early 20s and grew up in the apartment next to mine at Village Park. Or and in the same week, another young black man coming to the same fate here in Amherst. Racism and the constant erosion of worth by systemic, systematic, and structural embeddedness of anti-black racism absolutely contributes to the choice to end a life. Intent will only get us so far, and money is needed for the impact to the necessary actions to either begin or to be furthered along the path towards reparative justice and racial equality. Specifically, cannabis revenue presents a painful twist, if you will, 
Um, a couple of comments have been made about the 29 towns of mass with the disproportionate impact of criminalizing the black body. I don't bring the research data, but the lived experience of being a black person in Amherst for most of my life. Without much effort, I can name 20 black, 29 black residents, family, friends, peers who have been arrested, expelled, and or incarcerated. Some may still be incarcerated for either possession or intent, intent to sell of cannabis. And trust, serving your two-year bid is never the end of the story because once you've been in the carceral system, there are many roadblocks to federal grants, fundings, vouchers, and limited access to employment. And then it becomes a lived reality of obstacles and denials. And now that the face of the seller of cannabis changes, it is legitimized and people are making millions without any obstacle or denial that many black folk are still navigating. So in this cruel twist of faith, or predatory capitalism, this state and town still have beloveds incarcerated and or denied access to assistance for the very thing that others are profiting greatly from. Earmarking this for the purpose of reparations can never bring about justice, but it is an important step toward righting the wrongs, healing, and becoming the town I know we can be and that I believe we want to be using the budget as a moral document, and not to ever minimize, but putting our money where our mouth is. If we are truly committed to racial justice, equity, and the reduction of harm, a yes vote for cannabis tax revenue being directed toward the African Heritage Reparations Assembly to proceed forward with is an imperative. Thank you for listening, and please feel free to contact me for further discussion regarding this life-affirming and life-saving action. Thank you, Hala. Okay, and Alexis will take this home for us. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm honored to speak with you all today to implore you all to earmark all cannabis tax revenue for the Amherst African Heritage Reparations Fund. This would be a meaningful and impactful movement as a part of our efforts to repair the relationship between the town of Amherst and its black residents. Across our nation, we are wasting roughly $3.6 billion a year on enforcing specifically marijuana laws. And in doing that, black folks are arrested for marijuana four times as much as white folks, which matches our state usage is equal between both races. If we can intellectually determine that the war on drugs was never a war on substances, but on the people who use them, we know that within our country, we have had a part in negatively, sorry, in our county, we have had a part in negatively and permanently, physically, psychologically, financially, and spiritually affecting our neighbors' lives. Arrests can mean losing a job or benefits, not to mention the inherent dehumanizing and traumatizing experience of persistent police encounters. Contrary to what you might want to believe, Black folks are indeed much more likely to be arrested even in states that have legalized marijuana. So let's put all of that into perspective. In Hampshire County, okay, Black folks are arrested 18 times more than white folks. Let me remind you that our national and state average is four times. We have the second highest racial disparity for marijuana arrests in the state, only second to our neighbors Franklin County, where Black folks are 116 times more likely to be arrested. We are actively participating in this. We have been and continue to criminalize black folks for engaging in an activity that white folks not only get to enjoy with relative impunity, but now use as a means to build wealth. At the end of last year, 73% of active cannabis dispensary owners, employees, executives, and volunteers in Massachusetts were all white despite launching the first equity program in the nation for this industry. This means that we are currently committed to arresting black folks first and licensing them last. The current laws and systems are a means of surveillance and social control targeted at black and brown people that is counterproductive to public safety and community health. And black people know this. They know our police are looking for them. How much do you value feeling safe in this town? Who deserves to feel safe in Amherst? How many people's lives have we permanently impacted by our intentful decisions to enforce drug laws in these ways? How long have we been aware of these racial disparities and how long will it take us to make black residents feel a sense of safety and dignity and trust within our local government? Will we together send the message loud and clear to our black neighbors, business owners, teachers, students, and children, that we recognize the harms that we have caused and continue to cause, and that the ways in which our white residents and overall municipality has directly benefited from the mass incarceration and social control of Black Amherst residents. Will we together 
say that this is one of our paths towards a community that is no longer safe for just one demographic, but intentionally safe for BIPOC residents. The steps that we take can only be in the direction of reparative justice centered around racial equity, lest we continue to be vehicles for white supremacy. You can decide if cannabis will remain an asset to white folks and a liability to black folks. Thank you very much. And my sources are the Donahue Institute, ACLU and Mass Life. Thank you so much, Alexis and Hala and Dr. Shabazz. Um, and so that is, uh, that is our presentation for tonight. Um, and I know that we're moving on um, to vote the motion for it to go to the Finance Committee for referral. Um, so you, uh, I think I have to close the meeting first, but you're a welcome to stay yeah. uh, for that. Okay, so I'm going to, unless there are any further comments um, from any of the members. You can leave the meeting open until we're done. Okay. With, but what, what, till we're done with this item, okay? Sure. In case there's any questions that people want to ask. Uh, Athena, can you show a motion on the screen that would do the referral? Okay. So the motion that I'm going to make is to refer the request of the A. African Heritage Reparations Assembly to designate cannabis tax revenue for retail cannabis establishments from retail cannabis establishments for reparation to the Finance Committee for review and recommendation to the Town Council by July 18, 2021. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and um, we can take the motion down so we can see each other. And, and you meant 2022, uh, right? I'm sorry? You said 2021. You meant 2020. I meant 2022. I certainly did. Thank you very much. Uh, are there um, questions or comments at this time? Mandy Jo? I don't sit on FinCom, so I kind of have to ask my questions and make my comments now for them to consider them. Um, the first one is, this request is to send money directly to the, well, I, I don't know whether it would need a vote or not, um, in terms of if we earmarked money, um, would we still every year have to vote that specifically into the reparations fund since that is a savings account? Um, either way, it is my understanding that in the fiscal year 23 budget, the manager proposed um, that this revenue was already proposed in his budget as part of the op and to be used uh, unearmarked, which means it's part of our operating budget. Um, and so for the finance committee, if they were to come back with a recommendation to earmark, they also need to come back with a recommendation as to how to reduce the operating budget expenditures by that exact amount, $150,000. Um, and so that's one question. The next one is when the council voted a resolution that supported or sought a path for rep a reparative um, harm or to repair harm, uh, many people in support said it didn't deal with money immediately. Yet all we've been asked to do is fund a fund um, without a plan for how those funds would be used. Um, we had a discussion two weeks ago about how we were unhappy that the school committee asked us to fund a major capital project without which plan would be used. And we had two plans. And now we're being asked to earmark money without any plan at all on the table or any, you know, and I know you guys are working hard on the plan, but it seems a little premature to be earmarking funds when we haven't seen a plan as to how they might be used. Third, it is my understanding that we've already begun many restorative uh, reparation projects in town, including the press program, including all of our restorative justice practices in the schools. Um, they all need funds. That's where that $150,000 from cannabis in the FY23 budget can be going. But if we put them into savings, we need to find other money to fund those reparative programs. Um, and fourth, if we start down the earmark line, where does it stop? 
what else gets earmarked and where else do we fail to provide the flexibility we need to be able to fund all of the programs that we want to fund out of a very limited revenue source. So I hope the finance committee will consider all of these questions and concerns as it discusses this request and referral. Okay. Um, Mandy Jo, thank you for taking the tack of raising issues you would like the finance committee to deal with. I would like to encourage other counselors to do exactly that. Uh, Kathy, you're on the finance committee. Put your hands up. Go ahead. So I, I just want to um, frame a couple questions. I, I very much appreciate what Mandy did because I can be shorter. Um, when I thought of where the cannabis money could go was a little over a year ago when we were discussing the Crest program and it needed startup money, it needed support. And we haven't technically earmarked it, but it's sitting there in the operating budget. And in an earlier session tonight, we heard that we really need to support the Crest program. And the match between cannabis funds and Crest is so direct because it is a group that can have an alternative response to people in mental crisis with drug needs to combat what Hallis so eloquently talked about, this odd twist of fate where we have money from a substance that used to send people to prison. So I think we really need to take a hard look at before we take money out of a budget that is supporting a program that is just getting started. And we really have great hopes for it on the restorative justice, on the social justice end. I mean, we've made a real commitment to making this program work and it needs direct funding support. So that's one of the questions I'm building on what Mandy said. I, I think we, these are tough choices, but we have limited resources. Thank you, Shalini. We, can we hear Dr. Shabazz and Michelle's uh, responses to some of the questions? before I ask mine. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Shalini. I was actually gonna ask um, Dr. Shabazz to speak specifically to uh, the debate around um, the other demands on the budget that both Kathy and Mandy um, brought to light. So Dr. Shabazz, would you, rem we spoke about this earlier yes. today in our meeting. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think one, the, the council would um, uh, <clears throat> be well to remember the statement uh, that had passed a while back. Um, reparations is, in, in this instance, as we are discussing it, and as you charged us as a, as a town committee to look into, is it specifically is something concerning people of African heritage, people with a, uh, a history uh, in Amherst with the history in this country. Uh, we have not had all our discussions about the eligibility and, and where the program would particularly be, be addressed to, but we're talking about something involving African heritage people in relation to the systemic racism they've experienced in this town from its incorporation. So this is something very distinct. Crest program, uh, Office of Equity and Inclusion. This is for everybody. This is for everybody. This is, involves old people, young people, queer people, straight people, cisgendered people. This involves black, white, yellow, every other color in the rainbow. This is about everybody. So don't, so Crest Program is, is for everyone. Reparations is something specifically trying to look at how African heritage people have, have been affected by the anti-Black racism of this town. So I think we do well to be very clear if we are you know, still on board with, with reparations that we're talking about something for a specific community around specific harms. If you're still committed to that as you once were, uh, then, then that's then let's, let's wait for the plan. Let's wait for the cons con consultative process we're doing within the African heritage community that we'll do throughout the town uh, uh, and, and, bring and let us bring forth the plan to you. I don't think you'll have to worry. Any counselor has to worry. The money won't go anywhere. 
The money won't be misspent. The money will be in savings. So at the time you have a plan before you in about a year's time, then yes, you are the final decider. You will be the ones finally saying, what are the worthy projects that, that, that are coming forward? But, uh, uh, but just a little patience, a little faith, as we've been trying to be patient in this country for, for hundreds of years, I think we'll get to a place where we will all be proud of the work that's done in this town. Thank you. And just to quickly follow up on that, I just want to say that we certainly want to build bridges um, and build relationships with the Department of Equity and Inclusion, with the CREST program. Um, we see a lot of potential for working together, um, and we don't want to be pitted up against each other. And that is really harmful. Um, we understand that there are demands on this budget, but please do not start the narrative of pitting us up against each other. Um, everything needs to be done. It all needs to be done. It's not scarcity. It's not one or the other. It's we need, if we've made these commitments, we need to find a way to fund them. Shalini? Yeah, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, we are having these conversations. I want to acknowledge all the work that's being done by our committee. And this is not just a flippant thank you to everyone and politeness. I think we really do need to take a moment to acknowledge that our town and the people in our town really care and all the hard work that has been going on, um, you know, with all the residents who worked in the community safety working group, all the people who worked uh, for the reparations research and the ARA committees. I just want to say a big thank you uh, and to the counselors for having these conversations and the courage to ask difficult questions. So moving on with um, my question is that I completely support and being one of the initial co-sponsors of the reparations um, resolution, I completely understand and support the need for a separate fund for uh, reparations for people uh, with African heritage. And maybe this is not a question for ARA, but maybe it's a question for council and maybe for finance committee is really, um, and, I, I, and I feel it's really important that we allocate a consistent so source. We heard from uh, Alyssa Brewer, um, you know, representing the select board where they had recommended uh, cannabis funds be used for social justice, reparative, rep, reparations work. And we heard from, uh, we know that the C Cannabis Commission's guidance talks about cannabis revenue being used for restorative justice. So I think there's very, very compelling reasons that we allocate that funding for reparative uh, justice, social justice. And where I'm not clear is what that ratio needs to look like for black people uh, for black people um, reparations of black people and um, and allocating money for just social justice racial income racial justice um, overall and that's my question that I do not have clarity for and I want some discussion thank you Dorothy well, I think that Dr. Shabazz gave a great answer to the question. Um, reparations originally has to do with things that happened in the past um, and is a way of helping people to go forward in a more equitable way. Um, and the CREST program really is about how we act now and it is for everybody. So I think that uh, reparations is a sometimes more difficult concept for some people to to deal with, but I think it's a very important one and a just one, and it is a step. It is a, it is a step that must be taken and that will not re undo all the horrors of the past, but will be making a statement that we're trying to do something to even things out. So I support this motion. Andy? Yeah, I guess I have several things just um, one is that uh, there's a little bit of a misunderstanding about what Alyssa 
said, and I have to say this, uh, even though I think that I regret having to say it because I almost think it's irrelevant, the select board never did take a vote. There never was a motion to do anything with the um, cannabis revenue. Um, certainly that discussion took place and there were members of the select board who wanted that as a result, but it was not um, an actual action of the select board. But having said that, I sort of like an historian as opposed to anything else because I really don't think it's relevant. Um, I think it's ultimately a question of what this council thinks is right and uh <clears throat> whether so i just want to leave it at that on that piece um the plan that we came to last year and what we did last year was uh, we estimated the amount that was we thought that was going to be coming in from cannabis revenue and we made a transfer of that amount, but not with those exact funds. It was actually made in, from a different source of funds entirely into uh, a stabilization fund that was specifically a purposed stabilization fund for reparations. And uh, to take the money out, and Dr. Shabazz referred to this, to take the money out of the fund ultimately requires a council vote. So the council was putting money into an account, but the decision to um, spend that money was going to come from future decisions to be made. Uh, otherwise, the only other thing that I really appreciate the conversation that has happened. Um, I want to make sure that the finance co uh, committee has a good, solid, open um, discussion about this issue. And um, I welcome the uh, comments we've received so far and invite the people who've submitted, who've stated comments, if they wouldn't mind to send an email or something to the entire committee so that we have your questions and anybody else who has questions that they do so. Uh, and I will leave it at that because uh, anything more I say will get into uh, giving opinion that is not my business to have. So. Okay. Um, Jennifer? Uh, yeah, so I just wanted, I really um, appreciate Dr. Shabazz's very clear distinction between the, the money that would be from the cannabis, 100% of the cannabis revenue, the tax revenue that comes to Amherst to go for reparations to African heritage residents as being distinct from programs like CRESS that benefit the whole community. Um, I know that uh, Earl Miller came to the district three meeting and you know people have already approached him to, I mean, it, to help with issues throughout the community. So um, that it's, that's very different than the reparations to African heritage residents. And I feel that any, how that money is allocated, if it's to promote and enable home ownership, it will, it's gonna benefit the whole community. So, um, you know, I, I think it, it should be as that is how ARA was the, its mission. And I think it is reparative justice for um, particular residents in the community and it will help the whole community community as um, the new Department of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and CREST, all of it benefits, you know, everyone in Amherst. But I think it's important that the um, cannabis revenue be directed towards reparations and not, as Dr. Shabazz said, to efforts that benefit the whole community and aren't restorative justice to a particular part of our community. Um, and I also want to ask Andy, so what you were saying, because that's how I recalled it last year, that that wasn't cannabis funds that went into the correct. reparations fund. That is correct. So yeah. that, that would stay there. We're not deciding whether that gets moved or is that part of... That, that money has already been moved. 
Um, it was a money. It was an amount of money equal to the amount of estimated revenue on cannabis last year, but it was not a direct transfer from cannabis to the fund. So, so we're it, not it, that staying. And the it, fund is there. It's a savings account, as I believe Dr. Shabazz said, and you know it's there until it's spent. No, but I guess my question is with the cannabis tax revenue now for 20 for the fiscal 23 budget, is that something that the finance committee is going to address or has that money already been allocated someplace else? Um, Andy, go ahead if you want, would like, I mean, I'll, yeah. I can try it or you can. Um, I think that uh, we need to just uh, step back a second because uh, ultimately what would the committee finance committee has to do is figure out how you can effectively do this, even if you wanted to. We do not have a policy within the town or a practice, anything that we can go back on that automatically takes any source of revenue and puts it any place other than the general fund. Everything gets put into the general fund and then gets appropriated through the budget process from the general fund. And what we did last year in order to at least achieve the goal for the first year uh, was to, sit, to take the money that was left over at the end of the year that, would, that then becomes free cash, unspent money from the prior year and say, we're gonna take the amount equal to what was the, uh, cannabis revenue, tax revenue from the prior year and put it into a stabilization fund specifically for this purpose. And um, that's how it was done. So the source of the funds was not from the same place because it was actually leftover funds from the prior year as opposed to new year revenue. And, but it was based upon that dollar amount it goes back to some of the people that I've worked with in finance over the years who ultimately say in the end, a dollar is a dollar, all, fun, all dollars are fungible. And that's essentially what we were doing. Uh, the, in, we could continue to do that. It's a question of establishing a policy. There are a number of different ways to go about it. I think that's a discussion the finance committee has and that's why what I was trying to avoid getting into today because I think it gets ahead of where the finance committee ought to go and having the discussion. Right. So I, um, I wanna use that as a cue to people to raise the kinds of questions you want the finance committee to deal with or that you want to be part of the consideration in the discussion. Um, Pam. Good. So I look forward to a good, solid conversation in the finance committee. I think that's great. I would ask that maybe it get um, phrased a little differently uh, instead of uh, uh, having a good, solid conversation about the issue. Maybe we could say it's a good, solid conversation about the opportunity um, as opposed to an issue. Um, as an idea for, for conversation by the finance committee, uh, I would I would look at the um, Community Preservation Act um, structure as an opportunity to perhaps set some guidelines, set some targets for kinds of, of projects, kinds of things, and essentially um, have a, an allocation system that gets weighed and, and developed uh, through different criteria. So just something to ponder when you're looking and talking about structure. Um, thank you. Michelle? No, please go on. I'm sorry. I'll just, at the end, if I could just have a minute to just quickly touch on a couple of these things, but please. Sure. Pat? I, I don't have a question. I have a comment, so I don't mm -hmm. know whether you, all right. Um, two things. One, um, Andy, I was interested in what you were saying about you, the money, and I remember as you explained it, the money from equal to what happened to be the cannabis money 
was put into a stabilization fund. But there is a way of looking at cannabis money and saying, we're now, as that money comes in, an equal amount is going to be allocated. So I don't see a difference. in, And so I still I support the money coming from the cannabis revenue. The other thing that I want to say, and it's much more important to me and to other people, there's a Black family, a family whose uh, mother has been an incredibly active person in this community. And um, a lot of the work that is come out of the community safety working group, the uh, drive for the council to try to create Amherst as an anti-racist community has come from the energy of this particular woman. And her housing is in jeopardy. Um, And she may have to leave with her children, leave Amherst. And this, the reparations fund is critical and if it were it, it would not be my decision as a white person. It would be the decision of the people who were the people of African heritage who are running the fund, and that would be appropriate. But this is the kind of situation that could be addressed and cannot be addressed, as far as I know, from the council now. Um, so, you know, give your questions to finance, but damn it, fund this. <laughs> and do it immediately. Shalini? Um, uh, I just want to clarify that some people who mentioned that uh, just racial justice in general would include the CREST program. Um, And I'm not referring to the CREST program, but, you know, just speaking last year at the Juneteenth event to many BIPOC youth, and they were very interested in having a center for BIPOC youth because they needed their own space. And they spoke with very specific needs that they had to feel empowered to uh, meet their specific social, psychological needs, their entrepreneurial, creative needs. And so there are many gap, systemic gaps in our community around race and other forms of social in- injustices. So as a town councilor, I am committed to reparative work for all and addressing systemic racism and injustices. And I am committed to ensuring that the harm that was done to African American uh, or people with African heritage are also um, the reparative work is done in a meaningful way way that's backed by a monetary uh, by a budget and so forth so i just want to be clear that as a counselor i am looking to uh i am fully behind committing this stream of funding for um restorative justice for uh social justice racial justice and part of it going into uh reparations for people with african heritage but I really do want, this is not pitting people against each other. I think this is inviting a, a really wholesome, holistic dialogue amongst the different people who are who need this sort of funding. So I would really want to find out what are the opportunities that are going to be created to hear a conversation between different BIPOC uh, and ARA, and maybe ARA is already facilitating those and it seems like that would be a great, or maybe it's a community social justice committee, or maybe it's the two of them, I don't know, but there needs to be an opportunity for that dialogue to happen. How can this funding that's coming from cannabis be channeled for addressing um, this work? Thank you. Oh, and also, can we do we have the legal implications of offer, offering reparative justice based on race? There's, uh... That's a very good question. There are some legal things that Michelle and the AHRA have asked uh, through Paul for our legal counsel to work on. Uh, But I think you're also raising a question which is reflective in one of our public comments earlier tonight about an issue of whether um, there's been other parts of the country where They've tried this, but it's run into problems. We're not going to solve that issue tonight. Okay. I just want to recognize that that's, it's a, 
two things. Um, questions back to the finance committee. Mindy Jo? I want to address the, the issue that Michelle said that we shouldn't be pitting things against each other. The reality is in the proposed FY23 budget, that money, the proposed receipt of the 3% tax on cannabis is in the revenue side of the FY23 budget to the tune of $150,000. You can see it in a line item. The budget is a balanced budget. That budget does not at this time allocate any money to the stabilization fund for reparations, which means if there is an earmark, at least this is my understanding, which is why I want finance to look at this. If there is an earmark to earmark that $150,000 that is planned for income revenues in FY23 to the reparations stabilization fund, the, ba the budget is no longer balanced we cannot pass an unbalanced budget that is a deficit budget. If we take that $150,000 and add an expense line to the reparations fund, it is no longer in balance. It is a deficit budget that we're not allowed to have, which means you have to reduce the expenses by $150,000 somewhere else. It's not a matter of pitting any program against any program. It's a matter of reality of balancing a budget. And if you move that money to a different line, that is not in the budget at all right now, you have to find a way to balance that budget still. And so I'm asking the finance committee that if they make this recommendation to actually earmark the money versus what we did last year, which was take the extra money that was not spent on the FY20 budget and move some of it into the stabilization reparations fund instead of the regular stabilization fund, um, we need to know where that money is actually, where the expense budget is being reduced. And so we can't come back with a yes to earmark it and then leave an unbalanced deficit budget. It needs to be balanced. The realities are we only have so much income and a choice in one place to move money into a savings account instead of use it as the use it somewhere else means you have to decrease something somewhere else and not use it somewhere else. I don't know where to not use it, but that's the reality. And so that's something I'd like the finance committee to actually look into. And if they're going to make a recommendation on actually earmarking it, I'd like them to also recommend what line item is getting reduced by $150,000 because we would have to vote that as part of the FY23 budget too. Excuse me. And could I respond to some of these things? Because they're starting to pile up now. And yeah, but I on this particular one, I just want to say we're not going to have that debate here. Part of what the finance committee is the purpose is is to answer these questions. Okay. There's any number of ways to thread this needle. And I told I as a member of the finance committee. Totally understand the point Mandy Joe is making about the FY23 budget. So, um, but we're not going to resolve it. So, here tonight, Michelle. Yeah, I just want, I would like to clarify just in terms of intentions. Um, and, and thank you, Mandy, for, for bringing this um, to the surface. Um, so, I think what the African Heritage Reparation Assembly is asking um, is that some similar amount to last year, similar to the cannabis amount, be, be um, allocated from free cash for FY23 in the fall, as we did, um, but that for future years, a vote is taken about how cannabis tax revenue will be used. We do not wish to make an unbalanced budget. We do not wish um, to, to have, have to have that sort of debate. So the idea is what we're asking for is to contribute meaningfully as you did last year from free cash um, based on the model of the cannabis tax revenue and then to vote. And, and the reason why this is important, what Alyssa Brewer said um, is that the 
legislative body never had a conversation about how this new source of revenue was going to be used. And there was a timing situation where we went from select board to town council during the process that retail operations were opening. So it, it, it there was also that timing piece, right? And then um, town manager and the finance staff um, eventually started just putting it into the operating budget. So it's really about us as a council deciding how that money is used and not about creating an unbalanced budget for FY23. So I'm glad we had a chance to clarify that. I also want to say to Shalini, um, and just in response to some of what you were talking about, um, it's if, if we think about this in terms of uh, building a fund that could meaningfully repair the harm to the Black community. We're talking this year, for example, the cannabis funds are only $150,000. Um, if you look at the requests that the African Heritage Reparation Assembly made back in November prior to the budget guidelines being developed, it's in the multi-millions of dollars. And I understand that seems very unrealistic to some people, but now we're talking about $150,000. If we start slicing and Facing that, um, you know, we're we're really not going to be able to build a, an, an endowment, build a fund that can make meaningful repair. Um, and some of the other things that were brought up, I think, um, that Mandy asked initially, will definitely be ironed out in a discussion at the finance committee. So I'm not going to really comment on those things right now. Thank you, Dorothy. I just want to remind people that reparations is a program that has been going on for quite a while for uh, Jews and the Holocaust. Um, I know people who have actually been had restored from property their families had owned in, in various countries. The difference is that was 70 years ago and it's a difficult process, but it's, there's records. But when we're talking about reparations to some black Americans, that can go back 400 years. So this is, it's a challenge. And that's one of the challenges the committee is going to be working with. But it's not that the concept is unworkable or that it's a brand new concept. The idea of reparations exists. And so we should deal with it as, as something that has been done, can be done, and that we will be doing in some manner that we can do reasonably. Thank you. Are there any other comments or more specifically questions people want to make sure the finance committee addresses. Okay, so there is a motion on the floor. It's been made and seconded. It's a referral to the finance committee to come back. Um, actually, it's the first meeting after the 45 day kind of timeline we normally use. So it's July 18th. Um, Seeing none, then I'm going to uh, ask for the vote. Um, Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Bomil. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I, Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Yeah. Unanimous. Um, we are actually going to go on to um, I think Michelle needs and to do you want me to her meeting? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah I'm sorry. Hey, Michelle, you wanted to make a final comment. No, I, I, I want to really just say thank you and 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 really say that we we we're not 
we want to work together with the town, with the counselors, with everything that's going on um, and, and, and work together toward our shared goals. So thank you all very much for a very powerful discussion tonight and all of the questions. Um, and thank you to Alexis and Hala and Dr. Shabazz for being here. Um, and I'm going to adjourn the meeting of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly at 11.05 p.m. Great. Thank you, all of you, for joining us for this discussion. Um, all right. Uh, committee and liaison reports. CRC, Mandy Jo? Nothing to add. Elementary school building, Kathy? Uh, we have a meeting this Friday um, where we're going to be starting to talk and compare our options. And we're due two weeks from now to get a new round of cost estimates. Finance Committee, Andy. Nothing really to add to the written report. Just a rem uh, reminder that tomorrow morning, uh, if all of us wake up to for a nine o'clock meeting, it is um, the time when we're going to be meeting with the community uh, or the, the public safety departments, including CRESS, which is our new department. Right. GOL, Michelle? Really nothing to add other than in case you didn't read the report yet, um, the GOL made a recommendation uh, not to make any changes to standing council committees. Um, and that's all my brain can come up with right now. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, Jones Library, Anika. Uh, okay, yes. Yeah. So the uh, the outreach event at the library on May 3rd went well. There were over 100 in attendees um, in great part. It's, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, my brain at this point. Um, and this was due to the wonderful volunteers. It really wouldn't have happened without them. Uh, the building committee recently voted to keep the library designs green, which was perhaps our most substantial uh, design direction decision as of yet. Um, the library was also awarded a $200,000 Massachusetts Cultural Facilities Fund capital grant. And last, the outreach committee will meet tomorrow, Tuesday, the 17th at 4 p.m. Thank you. Um, TSO, Dorothy. We passed a motion, which we were supposed to discuss today, about the parking along Kendrick Park. Um, I just recommend that you read that uh, in the uh, TSO report um, and be ready to pass this at the next time it comes up. Thank you. Great. Any liaison reports? Pam? Yeah, quickly, planning board uh, did respond that they are, that the Solar Working Group is um, will begin to meet soon, which is good news. Uh, they will also begin to work on the solar siting study and the bylaw. Secondly, uh, they were tasked with looking at all the all the optional sites for parking structures in town, and that has not started. Uh, money to hire a structural engineer to do a, an assessment of the Boltwood Garage won't be available until July 1. I look forward to seeing that money spent on a structural engineer. Thank you. Okay, Jennifer Taub. Um, I was just gonna say that I attended a um, Amherst Affordable Housing Trust meeting last week. Um, nothing it's urgent and timely was reported. So I will add it on to my next, next report um, at the next council meeting for sake of time right now. Thank you. Anna Devlin Gothier. There's a little bit, um, I'm highlighting just one thing from ECAC, they've done a lot, but um, one thing that's coming up at ECAC is a little bit of a lack of clarity around their role as it pertains to council. Um, and so I I'm, I'm, would love uh, any feedback individually via email from folks in terms of uh, how the role of ECAC fits with council realizing our sustainability priorities. Um, there's questions about, and Paul, I, I look to you a little bit on some of this, right? There's questions about whether the chair of ECAC is allowed to communicate with me directly. Um, and if I'm allowed to seek their input on what priorities are, um, I'm gonna 
be very candid because it's 1110. It's going to be very hard for us to establish sustainability priorities if I can't have that open line of communication as the liaison. So um, I think some some clarity around that it doesn't need to be right now, Paul, obviously, but uh, would be really helpful. And then if other folks have ideas about, you know, how you've seen uh, committees engage, that would be really helpful. I know ECAC is a relatively new committee and their relationship with the council has fluctuated just based on um, role of counselors. So I wanted to just kind of throw that out on the floor, not expecting answers right now. Thank you. Kathy? Uh, CPAC will be meeting on June 2nd to talk about the track. So Doug Slaughter will be presenting. So just those of you who want to continue wondering how that project is moving along. That it's, a, it's an unusual, usually CPAC wouldn't be meeting at this time of year, but they can still be meeting because there are reserves. And it was, so that is scheduled 6 p.m. Okay, thanks. Um, we have no minutes, town manager's report, Paul. I have nothing else to add that was written to you. Are there any questions of Paul at this time? Okay, um, down councilor comments. I just want to remind people that tr please try to submit items to Athena and me by Wednesday before meetings because we need the items before we can draw up motions. Um, and with that, let me just say we are going into executive session. And let me just explain because this is the first time this council has ever done this. OK, so what happens is I'll make a motion to go into executive session and second it and we take the vote. At that point, we are not going to return to the public recorded meeting like we are in now. While we are on the in our meeting, Athena has sent you a separate link. It's a link that is not available to the public because it is an executive session. OK, so you will go off of this link and you will go into your email and you will find that link. And if you have any trouble, please text either me or Athena. OK. And then in the executive session, we have four items and I'll explain the order of those when we get there. So the motion to go into executive session. is as follows, convene an executive session for the following purposes. In accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21A6, to consider the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of two parcels of real property, the chair declares that an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the negotiating position of the public body. And the other bullet is the in accordance with Mass General Law 30A S 21A7 to release the previously approved executive session minutes of the following dates, January 28th, 2019, April 22nd, 2019, May 13th, 2021, May 18th, 2021, and August 19, 2019, and to approve and release the exec executive session minutes of the following dates, June 7th, 2021, June 28th, 2021, July 28th, 2021, August 2nd, 2021, and December 6th, 2021. That is a motion. Is there a second? Shane seconds. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and call the roll and yeah. Uh, Lynn, I was just going to say you need to declare that we won't reconvene an open session. The town council will not reconvene an open session. Thank you. Um, so, um, Kathy, no, Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Bumham. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin-Gothier. Aye. 
Then Grace Mary's an I. Mandy Jo Haneke is an I. Uh, the I'm I. sorry. Mandy Jo Haneke is, please. I. Please. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Anika Lopes. I. At least I didn't tell you how to vote. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> um, Michelle Miller. Yes. <laughs> Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. No. And Kathy Shane. Yes. It's unanimous. Um, and so I will see you in a minute on the next link. Thank you.